Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today, we are coming at you with a super-duper special episode, in that it's, you know, it's a normal episode, but we talk about important music to the to the people in this chat, this chat, this podcast. Words, they mean things, right? Magnus, yeah, yeah, how it, do they work? Today, it, we're going to be talking about... the most surgical episode we've ever done. Yes, or it is, ever because... Do. We are going to be talking about a release from Serge's favorite band, The Mountain Goats. We are going to be talking about their new record, which is called Getting Into Knives. And then yes. we are going to be talking about the new release from Clipping Visions of Bodies Being Burned, as well as we are going to be covering after this in a record club episode, my recommended record this week, which is uh, a for the first time on this, sh- we're talking about not technically an album but a compilation tunes 2011 through 2019 by burial a compilation of several eps that was made in the previous decade by a prolific idm artist burial so we will be covering that later that will be released on the same day afterwards go check that out yes talk about that a couple of things worth mentioning as well yes Um, first of all we're not going to be joined by morgan today uh, as you yes. will have already noticed, it's going to be the four of us today. Uh, mm-hmm. And secondly, uh, by the time you're watching this, there will already be another video on this channel uh, re- yes. per- pertinent to one of our discussions today. And that will be Sersha's video, which is counting down uh, all the Mountain Goats records up and up to, but not including Getting Into Knives, ranked from worst to best. So if you're into the Mountain Goats, or even if you're not super into them, but you're curious about their discography, go and yes. watch that video. And then you can see, because I'm, I'm presuming Sersha will give some context as to where Getting Into Knives fits yeah. in your discography. Yeah. But go and check that video out. Um, watch that first. Whether you do it now or, uh, or after you watch this is up to you, but definitely make sure you don't miss it. Uh, I've seen the future yes. and it rules. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. And I finished also- it this morning. God. Yeah, Sergio has been very hard at work trying to get this done. So please do go check it out. It is very much worth it. And also upcoming, Tyler and I are this week going to be recording our next B-Sides episode on progressive industrial metal titan, uh, Devin Townsend's band Strapping Young Lad. We are going to be going over that. I have lots to say about that uh that'll be very fun very fun episode we will be doing so look out for that in this next week uh yes. yeah that's strapping strapping for the young lad i mean that's a <laughs> strapping young envies so that, that was the episode catchy. of the jams and tea podcast um, <laughs> as always rock over london rock on chicago uh, strapping young wap Stella Artois, La Bière Fin du Luxe. Um, okay, so let's get into our first segment, uh, as we normally do, where we talk about yeah. what we've been listening to in the past seven days that we aren't already reviewing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jake, do you want to hit us up first? Yeah, sure. Um, I have obviously been listening to what we have been going to be talking about a lot, just because uh just important week this week, so I wanted to make sure I got all of that in there, but I've had lots of time to listen to stuff, uh, so primarily what I have been doing this week is I have been sort of branching off of my heavy metal kick from weeks prior. I have now become uh, more on a, a death metal kick and where better of a place to start with death metal than death itself. Uh-huh. This is a vinyl of the death album, Human. Uh, we are also going to be talking about that band on, I believe, March of next year. We have that slated for a B-Sides episode. Um, so, yeah, a couple months down the pipeline, but uh, look forward <laughs> to that. So I won't spoil my thoughts, but seeing as I do own a vinyl, I'm a pretty big fan. Uh, I listened to all of their records multiple times this week just because I wanted to re-familiarize myself with them, and it had been a long time. And good good gosh golly that band made a lot of good fucking albums holy fucking shit man i i 
I am in awe of that band's output. I mean, seriously, they have like their two least good records are like hard eight out of tens that are that are both just like so good and so worth going back to just to see where they built off of and then all their other records are fucking perfect and it's it's insane like i listen to them and it is and then I actively i'm just like okay maybe maybe like this one's better than the other and it's like it just doesn't happen i just listen to them and i'm like oh my god oh my god it's perfect oh my god and it's this this one uh is uh so far my favorite as to why I own it on vinyl and it's got this it's it's so pretty look at that I've been listening to those and um if you're not familiar with death uh they are basically the I I will hesitantly just so a bunch of metalheads do not jump down my neck about it they are mainly credited with being the the progenitors of death metal their first album scream bloody gore is sort of referred to as kind of the watershed moment of the like actual beginning of the death metal movement uh it's slightly disputed there's a couple other records that also came before that but sort of the definitive arrival um they're a heavy ass band so i've been listening to these a lot and putting myself through copious amounts of of mental torture in a way but now i've just gotten to the point where i'm like yes daddy hurt me more and um boy howdy i i love them i i have listened to them so much uh, and I will be vague on that just because we can go into more detail when we cover them more properly. Uh, I also listened, I re-listened to an old Jake Core classic because I actually, funnily enough, there's a, a small story that comes with this. One of the first albums I ever properly listened to um, because I really liked the song that was in the trailer for Train Spotting 2. Uh, Silk by Wolf Alice. I sought out the album that that was on, My Love is Cool, um, and I listened to that. And that was one of my favorite records for a really, really long time. Mm-hmm. And then I just sort of stopped listening to it just because I mm-hmm. discovered more music. And the thing was, when I tried to go back to it like a year and a half ago, I was just like, why does this album sound like dog shit? And then I'd remembered, oh yeah, this was before I really knew how to acquire music. And I just like converted YouTube videos into shitty bitrate rips of um, uh, songs. And, and it was in horrible quality. Like I don't, like it was like barely a hundred uh, uh, fucking, I don't remember what the unit rate for that is. But anyway, it was a terrible quality version of the album. So I sought out a, a, an actual good version and I listened to that. And it's great. If you've never heard Wolf Alice, they're kind of a grungy, indie rock, dream pop, shoegazy kind of thing. I would compare them heavily to like a midway point of the Cranberries early stuff and like My Bloody Valentine, kind of. Like if you can imagine what that sounds like, that's them um they they have two records but then they have songs like um you're a germ which yeah aren't aren't dreamy at all and they're just out to fuck no yeah yeah and and they're awesome super grungy i heard their second album visions of a life which i Mm. thought was fine i was a bit mixed on it but i did really good i did really like that one song uh don't delete the kisses i thought was an awesome song yeah um, I saw, great, I've heard their yeah, first song. album is better, so I want to check that out. It is. The first one is much better, and I think it was Mercury nominated, I want to say. Uh, the, the, second, the, second one, the second one, I believe, won the Mercury Prize. Oh. Okay. Wow. It's much worse than the first one. But that's I remember, okay. I remember yeah. that. I remember that because it beat out uh, A Fever Dream that year, and I was really pissed. Right. Mm, yeah, I'd be pissed. Yeah, it's definitely not better um, than A Fever Dream. Yeah, no. Sorry. I, I saw Will Fallis when I was at Leeds Festival, uh, and they were supporting the second record. They did a secret set, so they hadn't announced it. Just they put out on their Twitter, "Will Fallis are going to do a set here in like ten minutes. Be there." Um, and I went there and I saw them do it. Um, and it, they are one of the best like live bands I saw at that festival. Just really played to their strengths, and they played a lot of their more heavy songs. And it was just such a good time. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I would I would highly recommend checking that first album out. Get the deluxe edition because it, it comes with like 10 bonus tracks that are basically a compilation of their EPs and all the songs on those EPs are fucking great. Like uh Blush is a great EP. 
EP. Go check that out. But yeah, good, good, good album. Go, go listen to that. Why, why on um, earth would I want to listen to a compilation of EPs? That's ridiculous. How, how dare you suggest such a thing? Um, I also re-listened just because I was going through death so much. Uh, one of their sort of metal contemporaries. And sorry, just funny turn of phrase. You just see. <laughs> listening to death ah i do it well um no, not listening you say going through death go, going <laughs> yeah i mean i am constantly going through death but oh well um i i one of their sort of metal contemporaries as well as a huge influence on devin townsend of strapping young lad sort of a weird confluence of things that i revisited uh was the uh record uh, altars of madness by morbid angel uh, Morbid Angel being an industrial death metal band uh, that just sort of rose from that sort of sea of early 90s death metal. Uh, and that record's great. Uh, go check that out. I would say it has a lot of the same appeal as death records. It's a bit more like outwardly progressive, like they're more uh, like some of their later records, like Sound of Perseverance. Um, it's really listen to it with really good headphones. There's like the mixing and like the dynamic range on that album is fucking amazing like just really show-stopping stuff um it's only like 35 minutes long totally worth a listen um just really great kind of sludgy grimy uh prog industrial death metal just really like screeching vocals and fucking like just super abrasive so you know my shit it's it's really good um i also listened to Oh, uh, new listen, uh, podcast favorite here. I listen to The Replacements' Let It Be, uh, which is every bit as good as everyone has told me it is. Uh, it was a, like, that album's also, like, what, 35 minutes long? Like, not long at all. It fucking owns, too. Uh, just a really amazing punk record that just, it's every, it's, like, quintessential. It, everything you want to hear out of punk music and it's irreverent and it's emotional and it's silly and the instrumentation is generally very great um i i just li listen to that if you haven't it's it's amazing the superior let it be i will concur with uh, that assessment um and yes i listened to I guess I will say I listened to um podcast favorite punching bag tool I listened to my favorite record of theirs 10,000 days um which I still love it's a great album um I really think that it's just sort of the peak of what that band is capable of uh, both sonically instrumentally emotionally all that kind of stuff um that said I still have the problem with it that I have with every tool record in that like Maynard, like, what the what the fuck are these minute long tracks doing here? Get 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 them off! Nobody gives a shit. Stop it! These interludes are bad. I don't like them. This is an hour and ten minute long album, and there's like five songs on here that just don't need to be here. Stop. Uh, that said, it's probably the most underrated of the Tool catalog. I would highly recommend it. Um, if not just to hear the Wings for Marie Suite, a song about the passing of Maynard's mother, which is a heartbreaking and angry and just like, just a song full of grieving and emotional release. It's, uh, it's about as good as the band got. And uh, I love that album. So yeah, that's what I listened to some of this week. Lots of angry, loud metal boys. Nice. August, what's been on your uh, playlist? Um, some some re-listens, so I'll go through kind of the re-listens first and then I'll get into the newer ones. Uh, first re-listen, I listened again to Liturgy's H-A-Q-Q, -Q, which I had originally Banger. listened to in preparation for our Liturgy episode. Uh, and you know what? With all the time I've sat with both of the two, the artwork and um, HAQQ, I think I narrowly prefer the artwork, actually. Which, not a popular take, I know, but I, I just find the kind of 
just the way that album evolves and progresses to be a bit more sonically appealing to me, but I still think both are pretty good albums. Yeah, and of three. course, we will be discussing, worth mentioning as well, we will be discussing, yep. we have a new album, Very Close, uh, mm-hmm. we will be discussing it in four weeks' time, I think, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, in all hopes, yep. with, uh, with Zach on here, being part of our liturgy yeah. story on this podcast, mm. uh, on, on the original cassette from 1982 i re-listened to number of the beast one of uh just the most fun like consistently fun uh heavy metal albums of the 80s of course from iron maiden there's not a lot i can say about it other than it's not their best and if you think it is you've only listened to number of the beast that is true mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Continuing, another re-listen, uh, Bjork's Vespertine, which I ah. quite enjoy. Really great record to just relax to and kind of, uh, you know, this, no one cares. Uh, I care. I care. I uh, love that album. I, I, know. I also listened I'm, I'm, to it this week. It, it, oh, means, it means a lot to me that you enjoyed it because I wouldn't have bid on it necessarily. No, uh, it's, it, it's, I'm kind of, I've been kind of processing it and I enjoy it a good deal. Uh, but moving on, Fortet's Rounds is an IDM classic I had not gotten to, and I finally listened to it. It's really short. It's there, the energy on that album is absolutely kinetic. It's so entertaining to listen to, mm. and, uh, you haven't listened to it you should you should do that it's also yeah just like a lot of fun as well like it's super peppy and stuff like you get these uh like lots of really like fun moments songs like um she moves she and as serious as your life are like really fun and you get kind of beautiful slower moments that are really kind of haunting like uh the can't be what it's called but it's the song that has angel in the title um i know the one but that was really good and then then you've got that sorry you go Oh gosh, yeah, you've also got like that opener which just builds up and builds up and then you get that beat drop like yeah. two minutes in and it's amazing. And then you got like in the middle, smack bang in the middle of an album, you've got like a nine minute piano lead centerpiece. Like, oh, that was so good. It's an amazing album. Everyone should hear it. It's so much fun. Yeah. What's like, it called again? Rounds. Uh, rounds by the artist Four Tet. Two separate words. Who has yep. actually done some collaborative tracks with Burial. Yes. I, oh. I would recommend all of those also, uh, like Moth Nova yeah. and uh, Wolf Wolf Cub or something. Yeah. Bur- uh, Fortet's kind of like the, the, if Burial's kind of like a soundtrack for like a deep night soundscape, Fortet's kind of like the daytime equivalent, like much brighter and, and more like uh, conventionally beautiful. Yeah, and, and of course those tracks are very interesting to listen to because it's a mix mixes of both their styles in really fascinating ways. Yeah. And finally, a Searchacore album I listened to this week, Public Enemies: Fear of a Black Planet. Yay! I love that record. Which I had. I had not gotten, I had not really uh, delved deep into Public Enemies catalog, so I figured why not start here. Also, it was recommended to me. So, I mean, Fight the Power is obviously great. I think the first like 12 tracks on that album is a pretty consistently amazing run of songs. I think the back half is maybe a little, a little bloated at points. And that's just by virtue of it being from that era of hip hop where everything was too long. Yeah. <laughs> it's still it's still a very good, great album. Nice. I, I appreciate you listening to it and enjoying yeah. it. Thank God the Beastie Boys were cranking out like thirty-five minute records back then. <laughs> no, like I, 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 
al- there are plenty of albums of that of that you know t- peak CD era that are quite long that I think flow really well in the hip hop genre. I what I find amusing is that like it's kind of a hot take to, on this podcast to say that Nation of Millions is the superior <laughs> public enemy album, but but it's in the everywhere else outside this podcast that is just the conventionally agreed um, yeah. opinion. But here I'm just like oh you know Fear of a Black Planet is great great but like nation I, of millions I have is not heard nation of millions admittedly yeah. so i will have to get to that sometime oh. soon it's it's still very very good don't get me wrong it's it's you know yeah it's one of those albums that like it's like one of those albums like pet sounds or fucking the velvet underground and nico where you can be like this is basically like i would be hard pressed to disagree with anyone who says this is the greatest album in this whole genre Mm. Uh, even if there are other albums I like a little bit more, it's like sure. one of those albums that just has that feel. I mean, yeah. Like, for those two examples specifically, like, what what's going to be your counterpoint? Oh, I, I uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Pet sounds actually made me shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've As someone who there. only recently just listened to Pet Sounds, d- if you say it's mid, I'll kill you with my bare hands. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're just. God only knows what we'd do without him, though. Yeah, the, God the, the, damn the, it. the ch- children <laughs> do not know of what they speak. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. So, is, was, that, was that your week, August, or was there anything else? Yes, that was, that was okay, cool. My five. Thursday. Okay. Right. Well. Uh, right at the beginning, I listened to No More Shall We Part by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Yeah. Um, when well, it's, it's like when I was really getting into King Gizzard, it's like, I can't find a bad one. They're all amazing. You don't, don't turn. Don't miss. miss. <laughs> it's just like, it has been 35 days since my quest to find a bad Nick Cave album began. We are running out of food. <laughs> It's just like, like seriously, that. the the <laughs> closest you will get is Nocturama, and Nocturama is good. Mm. Yes. Uh, what about Kick the Pricks? I hear that's slightly. Um, that's all right. That's that's covers. I, I think. Yeah, isn't I think it? most of it is covers. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's still covers. good. Mm-hmm. It's just obviously yeah. lesser. Yeah. Sure. Um, I listened to Blackwater Park by Opeth this week. Um, I'm gonna be covering that in a few weeks. Yeah. Um, yes, guess what? Okay. I'm gonna rate it very highly. Because it just it was it ruled so hard. I oh also listened God. to it this week. Um, it was basically more like don't. Okay. <laughs> like, if you're more like I hope if you get a better fucking joke. <laughs> anyway, um, this was the day after I finished um listening to my note to every Mountain Goats record in a row twice. Um, so I just, instead of more sort of like folk music, I put on Blackwoods Park by Opeth, Scream Bloody Gore by Dead, and The Heavy is a Really Heavy Thing by Strapping Young Lad. Yeah! Um, Had a real change of pace. Um, and I'm going to be treating all three of those as one segment. Don't challenge me. Um, I also listen... uh, What's Donald Trump's favorite black metal band? Copeth? Ropeth. Oh, <laughs> I, I could use some rope right now. <laughs> uh, okay, um, I also listened to um, the Black Saint and the Sinner Lady by one uh, Mr. Charles uh, Mingus. Uh, you don't need me. One. You don't need me to tell you that this record is very good or even amazing, <laughs> because it it is. We all know it is. Let's move on like, with our lives. It's kind of like when you get into jazz and you hear records like that, you're just like, well, fuck. You know? <laughs> what, yeah. what can I Otherwise say? Otherwise known as me when I listen to Bitches Brew. It's just like... Yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there should be an editor of Charles Mingus where it's Big Chungus and it's Big Mingus. <laughs> A cool fact do it about uh, Black Satan the Center <laughs> that you may, you may have learned, Sersha, when you were listening to the mm-hmm. album, is that the liner notes of the record were written by Mingus's therapist. Oh, I didn't know that. At Mingus's <laughs> request. So, 
Oh, or a psychiatrist, wow. I should probably say. I don't know if therapist mm-hmm. was a thing in the 60s, but but um but yeah, so that's kind of an interesting fact. Like there's a lot wow. of like lore and story going into that album that's quite fascinating to read about. Oh, that's crazy. Um yeah. Yeah, I, uh, it basically wow. that album took so much out of Mingus mm-hmm. that he didn't make another record, I think, for seven years after it. Yeah, you you can hear it in the music. Yeah. yeah, you can hear that so much of that is going into it. It's just such an emotionally powerful record. Yeah. Um, speaking of emotionally powerful records, I also listened to Darkness on the Edge of Town by one Mr. Oh. Bruce Springsteen. What? Oh, shit. Wow, you kept that a secret. Yeah, you did. Well, I, write, I logged it on my music board, so, so anyone who followed me would have been able to see it. Ah. Um, I liked it a lot. Um, I, yes! I, I still Finally! Hey, I already liked um, his fucking album that's him with a guitar that's white. Uh, has Born to Run. Around. Thank you. Yeah, I already really liked that one. Oh, okay. Uh, I was fucking better. Yeah. Um, you don't uh, get to dislike Nebraska and Born to Run. That is a no, criminal no, no, offense. That's fine. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I don't think I like this as much as Born to Run, but I, I liked it in the same ballpark, if yeah. that makes sense. I, can, I can't be mad at, at anyone who prefers either of those two. They're just so perfect, both of them. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I also listened to Bjork's Vespertine, and all I can say is like it's no medulla, but um, that <laughs> I, again, only on this podcast would you hear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> hey, Vespertine is an amazing record. It's just that it's medulla great. just hits me in that in that special mm. place in my brain. Yeah, the medulla, Meanwhile, you might even say. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm slowly kind of moving back to my childhood opinion of thinking that homogenic is the best Bjork. <laughs> Homogenic is great. Valid take, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but no, I, I still really like Vespertine. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that your week or? That five segments on records. Cool. Okay. Uh, so I'll do mine now. Um, so oh, a, f- a few things I want to shout out. Um, um, so the first thing I'll shout out uh, is actually a record, uh, a new release record that. Um, kind of snuck up on me and so it wasn't really enough time for us to for me to consider whether we should cover it as a podcast and also i think it would have limited appeal on this podcast anyway um, i have a feeling i listened to this record as well oh okay well Maybe. The, the album is the is the new kind of solo release from adrian linker of big thief was oh, that no, the album okay no, nope. no, oh, no, 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 no i know what you're talking, thinking about as well and i'll talk about that briefly uh as well mm. but anyway so um Big Thief are this kind of folk indie folk band who kind of have sort of risen through the <laughs> just <laughs> What does that mean? Are you not a fan, Sersha? No. No, you said indie folk and she was like, like Oh, okay. I thought you were doing mm. like um because I've never heard you talk about them. But yeah, they are no, no, like, I mean, just because I haven't listened to them. <laughs> okay. So they're a very kind of like um minimal indie folk band who have kind of become very popular in the last couple of years. They released two albums last year uh, and both of them were like uh, two of the highest rated albums on, on Metacritic for the entire year. And um, both are fantastic in my opinion, but they're not like albums that are like immediately welcoming. Like they're albums that mm-hmm. uh, sort of get under your skin and stay with oh, you. Oh shit. I have these. Never mind. I have heard yeah. these. Yeah, so so those two albums, UFOF and Two Hands, I think they're what, what they were called, came out last year, and both of them were highlights of the year for me. And so Adrienne Linker is the front woman and uh, principal songwriter of the band, and she has done solo work in the past as well. But she released. Uh, it's difficult to know whether to, whether to quantify this as two records or one record. It was released as two albums on streaming services, but it is considered one holistic project by Adrienne. So I'm going to consider it one album. Uh, and it's called Songs Slash Instrumentals. And basically what it is, 40 minutes of folk songs and then another 40 minutes of, obviously, uh, instrumentals. Um, and so they kind of come together to make one 80-minute double album. Uh, and it's just one of the most beautiful and rich and gorgeous uh, albums I've heard all year. Um, Adrienne has this fantastic and unique way of writing folk music where it's kind of like elusive um, the melodies are kind of elusive, but there's this emotional tangibility to it that makes it really kind of just sinks its hooks into you. Uh, the songs are about, I think, uh, losing a relationship, 
um, but the kind of the lyricism is a little oblique and more esoteric, so you kind of have to dig into it to find that. But then there's these startling moments of clarity as well, where it's like the emotional wave that just hits you. Um, and it's like, yeah, and the progression from the conventional kind of folk songwriting of, of the first few songs on songs to the kind of more sparse and quiet instrumentals uh, that are not afraid to kind of play with silence on the instrumental side kind of shows this could be kind of evaporation of this relationship over time. And it's quite powerful um, mm -hmm. the way that it's translated uh, musically. Uh, super good stuff. Uh, it's definitely going to be on my album of the year list at the end of the year. Really great. Um, but I think that it will have limited appeal on this podcast. I'm not too mad that we're not covering it. But if that does sound like the kind of thing that might appeal to you, definitely check it out. Even if you haven't heard Big Thief, uh, it's still really great. Uh, okay. I also want to... One funny note I have to make real quick. Yeah, please. Uh, while you were describing that, there, there was just one ringing thought throughout my mind. I was like, this is 100% best new music on Pitchfork. There's no way this isn't. Oh. Yes, yeah, it is. And well, I checked, and of course it is. Yeah, it got it like an eight point yep. eight, I think. And and big and Pitchfork were like massively into Big Thief's last two records as well. It's no surprise. Okay, um, so yeah. And I, I think to to a certain exactly. extent, that kind of dick sucking hype has kind of ruined Big Thief for some music listeners who aren't kind of already into that sort of thing because it sets up an expectation, and the music is really not immediate. It's quite. It, it, you really kind of just have to let it sink in and, and listen to it a few times. And, and I don't want them to get radio headed like by pitchfork. Yeah. Um, um, but they're a great band and, and Linker's new album is really, really special. Um, okay. So I also started listening to death this week. Uh, I listened to um, their first two albums, scream bloody gore, which was excellent. And leprosy, which was out of this fucking world. Good. Um, Le Le Leprosy just fucking beats the shit out of you, and I <laughs> love it. The the possibility that there are better death records along the line, <laughs> frankly, terrifies me. I'm not <laughs> physically ready for that. Um, yeah. So there, there's some, it's it's like a good horror film. There's um people always say about horror films that they're sadistic. They are deeply masochistic, yeah. and it's the same with metal when it's really good. It's, it's just I want yeah. to feel pain. Yeah, so... Yep. Um, and you get it. Oh, boy, do you get it. So I won't linger on death because they've already been discussed uh, in this segment quite extensively. Uh, I'll also shout out, I listened to the new Gorillaz album, Song Machine Season 1, um, this week. AKA uh, a, a Peter Hook single and like 10 other songs. Well, the thing is, this album is... <laughs> the whole point about this album is that it's like collaborative. Like every song is loaded with collaborators. You've got... Um, people like fucking there's a, like jpeg mafias on this fucking um i'm gonna have to bring it up now because i've already forgotten but yeah i'm not a big fan of the gorillas generally and this album doesn't sadly does not do a lot for me even though it seems to be quite popular so there's robert smith's on this album bex on oh, this shit. album saint vincent's on this album elton john's on this album a slow tie is on this album um what's the fucking budget for all these people uh unknown I don't mortal know, orchestra but damon albarn's got album. a wide wallet yeah, unknown mortal orchestra's on this album skept is on yeah. this album uh, basically so many people on this album and it's like wow you have so many talented people and so few good songs <laughs> it's really surprising that's um, that is always the case with gorillas for me I'm, 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 I'm like the only person on here who's a gorillas fan well look I'm being a bit harsh. This, there's not, this is not a bad album by any means. In fact, there are numerous songs on here that I would say are quite good, actually. Uh, like the, the Robert Smith song is excellent, actually. But the real standout on this record is, is as Jake's already alluded to, the Peter Hook uh, feature. Yeah, Eric, track, so Eric, good. Which Amazing. basically sounds like uh, what a New Order song should sound like in 2020. Like it's fresh. It's, I mean, really the only thing that lets it down, and it doesn't even really let it down because I think it's a perfect song, is like I, it's just Damon Albarn's voice on it. I just wish it was a different, <laughs> a different person singing it. But I, even that doesn't, it's not like bad. I still think the song is amazing. Uh, it's definitely one of the singles of the year, easily. So yeah. worth checking out. Um, yeah, and I would even suggest like, even if you don't want to listen to the whole album, just flicking through the songs 
at least is worth doing it because there might be some things on there that you like more than I did. Um, it seems to be it seems to be generally getting regarded as one of their best records. So that's yeah. I, I'm pleased for them. Uh, but yeah, I've never super, been super into them like really ever. Uh, even though I don't hate anything I've heard, it's just kind of all washed over me a bit. Um, yeah. So, so okay, I'll shout out two more things really quickly. So first thing I'll shout out is um, Bruce Springsteen has released a new record uh, with the E Street Band, Letter to You. It was recorded, I believe, like in over a space of just a few days in February. Like it was recorded oh, really? very quickly. Like they were just wow. like, we want to get a lightning in the bottle thing where we just, we don't overthink any of these arrangements. We don't toil over them like we have in the past. We just go into the studio and we just kick the fucking doors in with, we try and get that sound. Because I haven't seen the E Street Band live, but you, they're, what you hear about them as a live act is kind of legendary. Like they play for yeah. hours and they just absolutely blow your face off the whole time. And so Let It, Let it To You definitely seems like an attempt to capture that on record. And um, while obviously I don't have the actual live experience as a counterpoint, I think they do pretty damn well. Like uh, I have dipped in and out of, of nearly every Springsteen record over the years. And this is probably comfortably the best one since uh, The Rising in 2002, uh, which is, you know, which is a pretty good album. But uh, and, and I might even like this one better, frankly. Um, I, I'm even tempted to say this might be my favorite Springsteen since Born in the USA. Um, it's very good. It's not like, you know, it's not like a masterpiece or anything. And there's certainly, there's a couple of kind of slightly weaker moments on it. But uh, what's really impressive about it is the way that it captures and sustains that energy the whole time. This record never flags. It never kind of really slows down in a way that makes you feel like you're getting let off or the band are kind of out of steam. Like they're full bore the whole time on this thing. It's loud. And and, and it's well sequenced too. Most of my favorite tracks are actually towards the end of the record, which is awesome. Um, I like Ghosts is amazing. And um, uh, the penultimate track is my favorite, but I've forgotten what it's called. Um, anyway, uh, super amazing record. Um, strong. It's, it, it's funny you say that because like, in my opinion, at least, like the, like the band, the playing and the instrumentation and arrangements are like the best part of it. The, the fact that they just went in and fucking did that is like, I didn't know that beforehand. And now that I do, I'm just like, holy shit, you guys, that's impressive as fuck. Yeah. It is a good album. I, I have listened to it. I, I do think it's quite good. And it does, I think, speak to the effect of like when you've got a talented band who know what they're doing, like sometimes mm -hmm. the best thing to do is can just be to not overthink yeah. things and just go in and bang it out. And they do that. And it's really special. Okay. Last album I'll shout out. I'm not going to say very much about it at all because we will be reviewing oh, it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> of course. Uh, so uh, you'll probably be aware uh, that Orticker have uh, surprise released their second album in the space of two weeks uh in 2020 mm. um it's not depending on how kind of into autic you are it's not really that much of a surprise that it exists they did suggest earlier in the year that they had two albums ready what's is surprising about it is how quickly well a couple of things how first of all how quickly this one has arrived after the previous one my, my theory is that they wanted to release them at the same time but the label said we can't we can't market that we I wonder where i've heard that one up. before yeah yeah it's gonna come up in a minute but yeah. yeah and and another interesting note about it is that um in the pre in the past sort of the catalog number like the warp catalog number on all tech oh, albums yeah. refers to kind of suggests or refers to the the number of the album in all tech discography but both sign and plus uh the numbers add up to 14 so i sound like i'm fucking um <laughs> Neo. Be Sylvia, Peppy Sylvia. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> like, the point is, it seems like uh, this is considered, they're considering Plus to be uh, not a companion piece or an addendum to sign necessarily, but an extension of it, which is really interesting because mm. it goes in a lot of different directions sonically. Mm. So we'll be discussing that. I think our review will go up later in November to coincide with the vinyl release. So mm -hmm. if you are, uh, if you did enjoy our previous Orteca review, which was last week on sign, um, then we will be reviewing plus. We're just going to give it a little bit of time, I think. Um, yeah. 
just because we did just review auto again and also because this is a record that i think takes a bit of time to absorb and i think Sersha, you listened to it yesterday you can attest i to did the fact, i did you can attest to the fact that it's not as friendly as sign is it's not as immediate as sign um and, well look it's its level of unfriendliness is, is up there even for Autaka compared to but especially compared to sign um, but it's like, I wouldn't say it's as unfriendly as like Confield. Um, no, I wouldn't say it's as unfriendly as, as some of that stuff. But I will say uh, it's probably, I've heard, having be, being the Ortega fan I am, I'll say I think Plus is probably the least immediate album they've ever released in the sense that mm. it, it really kind of is, takes you aback a bit and takes a little bit to adjust to. I, I think it's mm-hmm. probably deliberately unfriendly, almost maybe as a reaction to sign. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that will... I'm not gonna. I'm gonna stop there. We'll discuss that in a few weeks' yeah. time. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, um, so that's it's, that. it's that's going to be the second time in like a month that we review a band's second album of 2020. Yeah. Isn't that strange? Yes. <laughs> I, I'd also just just briefly. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this in in detail or anything. Thing, but just because it's something that I only just heard like today and because it is a new release that is for at least to my knowledge has gotten no attention whatsoever um li- a- just everyone listeners and podcast mates please check out the record Ellen Gaist by Crippled Black Phoenix they are a post-rock progressive rock slash like just like I guess I could most comparably put them alongside something like swans um except a bit friendlier I I guess in approach there that album's amazing and will land very highly on my album of the year list go check it out it's like super it's very lush post-rock it's very like everything in the kitchen sink it's very like dense and surprisingly immediate for the genre and i've heard no one talk about that album and i just really want to put that on people's radar because it's quite quite Mm. quite quite good that is sick i'm i'm writing that down right now exciting crippled crippled black phoenix is a name that's hard to forget (laughs) yeah well as soon as you said oh i need to shout out this new album it's by a band called crippled black phoenix i'm like yep of course this is definitely a jake thing (laughs) hey it's not as bad as an autumn for crippled children that is yeah. a band. That, that, I didn't make per, that up. Per, perhaps, gentle piece of advice is that perhaps bands should stop using the word crippled in their names. <laughs> perhaps. Perhaps. Um, but, you know, crippled lad. <laughs> I'm sure, crippled young lad. I'm sure this will be uh, an interesting record. I look forward to listening to it. Yeah, it's very good. Okay, uh, let's move on to our main releases. I think actually yeah. first up today is Clipping. Um, it is. So, Clipping. Uh, oh, right. who, would, who would like to kind of... Uh, concept, contextual. I, I'm definitely going to take Mountain Goat, so let's leave this to yeah, Jake. I, I will. I will be because I am probably the 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 most resident and storied person with clipping here. I've heard everything they've made to date multiple times, just because I'm a fucking enormous fan. Um, like I like it, it'll be hard to catch me on a day where I'm not trying to hop on David Dick's dick in some way or another. Um, that said, they are a <sighs> I guess, are they a trio? Yes. Yeah. 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 Clipping is a trio in industrial sort of hip hop group uh, front led by Davi Diggs, who you probably, if you don't know from this, he has an acting career. He was uh, the star and co writer of Blind Spotting, uh, and he is also in the very popular uh, show Hamilton. Um, but this is sort of his main musical project. Um, they sort of came onto the scene with their uh, album Mid City, uh, which got lots of acclaim when it came out. And then they followed Mid City up with cl- Clipping, didn't have any eyes in it, sort of a self titled, um, which got like massive, massive acclaim. And then they followed that up again with another very uh, widely regarded but slightly slept on album called Splendor and Misery, which is a concept sci fi album about a slave ship in space. It is fucking awesome and then after that they came along with um 2019's uh there existed an addiction to blood which is sort of the companion album to the album we are talking about today uh it was 
a notable direction just because they steered more into horrorcore, which is not something they were totally divorced from before. Mainly, Clipping's goal when they started was to be sort of a dark black mirror reflection of a lot of the core tenets of the hip-hop genre. Uh, sort of a parody in, in many ways, but very taking themselves still very seriously. Uh, and then with Splendor and Misery, I think they sort of like like ventured out conceptually, and now we have them going harder into genre leanings, but also using that as an avenue for exploration. They have always been very idiosyncratic with their beatsmiths, their sound play. They sample incredibly odd things, incredibly like simple things, just like metal scrapes they can just fucking sample into a fucking song um just like lots of random shit very grassroots kind of stuff uh and that is not abandoned on their existed addiction to blood and it is not abandoned here um this was announced earlier this year and its album cover is very similar looking uh as you can see it's 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 got lots of teeth on yeah. it and yeah i have the vinyl so yeah this is a spoiler um, um, probably but, a, an also important bit of, of context to, to add on to that is that yeah. I, I believe uh, blood, ex there existed an, addic an addiction to blood and this album were originally intended to be one album. Uh, they they uh, are. Actually, I have irrefutable proof of that in that the vinyl um, for um, Visions of Bodies being burned here does not have, it does not start off with side A and side B. It starts off with side E and side F. Uh, so oh, this is originally supposed to be composed as a double album, but I am guessing that the label was probably like, uh, that's a bit much, guys. We might need to break that up a bit. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in addition to evaluating this album, I'll probably also give like a quick just general evaluation of the project as a yes. whole. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. no, don't worry, don't feel like you have, you will have to do that as well, but um, I know these I albums, I, I can't do that. I that's fine, but I know both of that. these albums like the back of my hand, so I can yeah, pretty, same. pretty comfortably um, say how I feel it works as a unified quadruple album, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you were saying, Jake. No, uh, that's, I mean, that's pretty much what leads us here is that this is sort of the sister album to um, There Exists an Addiction to Blood, which I've mentioned many times on this podcast as being one of my favorite hip hop albums of that decade and just in general. So this had a lot to live up to expectations wise. I have high standards for clipping in general, and I have high standards for anything that is going to assert itself along with what I consider to be their absolute best work. So that all said, is there anybody who wants to like get just fucking go balls deep immediately uh, so far? Just because I know I've got a decent amount to say. I know that I think, most people here might. Um, I, I don't want to go first because I kind of struggle to write about this, but I, I do have <laughs> okay. things to say. Um, I wonder, uh, August, do you want, would you feel comfortable going first? Uh, yeah, I could give it a shot. Yeah, August is the only person who I don't actually know what he thinks of this album. Yeah. yeah. Well, you never know what I think because I rarely say anything to anyone about the true the wild album. card. Yeah. So uh, visions of bodies being burned. We've got this kind of, uh, and I am approaching this as this being my first uh, clipping album that I've heard. So if I say things that are just like, oh, widely accepted uh, canon canonical parts of the band's uh, sound, and I, I explain that in a way where it like, impresses me and you're like, oh, well, fuck you, I haven't heard any of the other ones. Uh, That's, uh, we what understand. I immediately find interesting lyric on a lyrical front is uh, the way this album uses horrorcore to kind of divorce itself from a lot of the typical kind of posturing and womanizing so commonly associated with hip-hop and when it does that it is like in service of a point being made like commenting on the sexism that is something that is often tied to like bad horror stuff or just like bad parts of the genre in general it is making broader points about that and often the and and that's only on when this is kind of i guess 
poking fun at like the more stereotypical like crappy Friday the 13th uh, Michael Myers kind of junk on like uh, 96 Nev Campbell Campbell whatever Campbell yeah Campbell Campbell the fourth one uh, with the kind of this bitch boss uh, part to it uh, and and that's just what I observe as like a general lyrical theme here. And I mean the the influence of, of films is very wide. Like there's stuff like Candyman, uh, Eaten Alive by Toby Hooper, along with like Lovecraft on the song and Lacing. Yes. Mm-hmm. That song is particularly cool because it kind of uses a lot of cloud rap and, and vapor wave pastiches yep. to create this very atmospheric, eerie feeling. Uh, but jumping to the front of the album, you've got this intro which just hits you with these really heavy 808 pads that I, I was frankly initially thrown aback by because it's just not something you expect to get out of a hip-hop album for it to just start just gruesomely oppressingly uh, that, that was a phrase i said but uh, i mean then, it was still cor- it was correct <laughs> uh, yeah yeah and then you get this kind of you get this kind of flow from david which initially kind of seems very clunky but you realize that is the point as it gets as his flow gets smoother and smoother across this track until he does the uh drop of the band's name and vocals sharply cut off and you lead into uh say the name which is just some of the most joy i've ever had with like a hip-hop song period You've got that. Fuck yeah. uh, and it in the dark, the the body being burned. Burned. You've got that hook, and it's great. And then you've got the lyrics, which are commenting upon Candyman, the film, and using the film's commentary to then extend and make its own points. It's it's incredible, and you've got so many great lines like uh, the hook going to be the last thing she remember. Of course, referring to a literal hook and the song's hook, which is just amazing. That's just such an amazing Uh. cheeky reference there. Uh, Generally, I just find the storytelling on songs like uh, Check the Lock, Eaten Alive, Body for the Pile, uh, Pain Every Day. The storytelling here is just immaculate because it gets across this. It, it, it all is so very evocative and the imagery is just gorgeous. The lyricism, the uh, lyricism is all just very, very good. And what's so great about all of this is it's just going from style to style while staying grounded in this kind of industrial hip-hop uh area with horror core influences it's uh and then you get that last track uh secret piece which is like a yoko ono composition interestingly yes. enough yeah and that, that's such a great way to close it um, yeah it has I, a really cool um once you kind of like read about what the piece is and what it represents it has a really cool way of kind of like uh bringing the album full circle i think and kind of tying yeah. it together same with piano burning which was the closer of the last one they both have this sort of conceptual music interpolation that's very yeah. specific to them that and makes like a broader point that's actually mm. a thing that is true of every single record they've done ends with a conceptual yeah. art piece which i think mm-hmm. is an awesome little uh trademark yeah. awesome little idea uh, i guess um if I have some immediate criticism that I can think of, I find the interludes, as always, I'm not a big fan of, particularly like the voice acting on uh, Witchboard is just awful. Uh, I wonder, is that, I wouldn't be surprised either way, but is that like uh, a, just literal voice acting, like for the purposes of this album, or is it taken, like, is it just dialogue, like ripped from a B movie? I, I, I read on. I actually I, don't know. 
I checked Genius. It didn't say anything either way. But yeah. I I mean I guess if if that was their intention that that's all well and cool, but I still don't feel it works in its particular place in the track list, breaking up Say the Name and 96 Nev Campbell. It, it would feel more appropriate to place that I don't know, in before so, before the songs where they go on about ghosts and stuff, that would just seem to be a more appropriate place for a uh, Ouija board type interlude. Um, yeah. But yeah, overall, I find this to be a very well put together sonically album. Uh, the flow, the pacing of this album is incredible, it's immaculate. It's the run, the 52 minutes flies by. It is so short. Uh, yeah, every song, like all of the main tracks here are very good at their kind of storytelling, the, the points they're making about the African American, the points, I guess, David, because of the writer is making about the African American experience within America, within horror as a genre. It is all a very, it's something that I've just, what makes it feel so special is I just think I've never heard anything quite like it in the genre. Yeah, it's, I think you make a, sorry. Sorry. Yes, I was yes. just going to say, I think you make a really good point about the link between um, depictions of the african-american experience and hip-hop which obviously is a big part of it and the the horror core the adoption of horror core as an aesthetic on this these last two projects and it's kind of like um what david and the, and the group do so well is they kind of they find the parallels there between the kind of experience of living as a as a person of color in america in the current era and you know horror movie tropes and 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 yeah and that kind of thing but but they do that without they thread that connection without being like super overt about it. Uh, it's very much kind of subtextual. You infer that through the experience of listening to it. They don't spell it out for you. Um, and it's quite effective and powerful. And also what makes it so, um, I mean, obviously I'm speaking as a person who is not a person of color, but what is, is, what is also cathartic about it uh, and about this particular record is uh, the way that that is also subverted in certain senses. So it's not always just about, um, describing the experience of living in terror and fear it's also about um this kind of a cathartic depiction of getting to express re the revenge and violence upon your oppressors as well and a track like, body for the pile especially yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's another one uh, as well that, day, also. yeah pain every day both of those two yeah. songs which are two mm -hmm. of the best on the record uh capture that beautifully and i'll i'll talk about them a little bit more uh when I, because I, I don't really have a review for this album. I just kind of have disconnected thoughts. Uh, I love it a lot. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but just that general, the way that kind of that theme of the album of the albums kind of uh, is just quite. It's on an initial glance, it might seem like gimmicky, um, but I just the more you kind of let it seep seep into you, and the more you kind of experience the records, you realize there's a real kind of depth to it that um the band leave for you to discover uh and and what's really uh thrilling about um about visions of bodies being burned from me and why i prefer it to and even though i love uh there existed an addiction to blood but why i prefer this record is that to me this is the most visceral and uh violent and uncompromising thing that clipping have released uh, at least since mid city and perhaps even uh, more more violent and affecting than that record because where that record was just like a pure noise album with the hip-hop stuff um, this does that but it also has a little more, bit more thematic depth and tangibility to it um, it it really just gets under your skin like they're not afraid to do something like just open a noise with uh, opening a track with blistering noise that's almost deafening like they do on make them dead um, or uh, just engage in full-on exercises in music concrete for upwards of five minutes, like they do on Eden Alive. Um, the band are, and 
and they, they managed to do this kind of really uncompromising and often like not conventionally musical stuff without it feeling like this is them trying to be deliberately provocative or make an experimental record that um you know for the sake of that like it's all feeding into and then uh, responding to the the aesthetic and scene that is set lyrically uh, every element of this record the way that it is put together uh, ties into all of the other elements of it uh, it's just really really uh, remarkable stuff um, uh, and just the, the features on here are so well deployed as well. And it's not just rap features as well. You get uh, some surprising uh, instrumental and production contributions across this album as well. One of those that I want to shout out is the uh, inclusion of very dissonant and unsettling guitar work from, uh, what's his name? The, the, the guitarist from the band Tortoise. Um, who yeah. contributes uh, incredibly dissonant and ugly uh, guitar work to Eaten Alive uh, that, is, that I really love. Uh, Jeff Parker is his name. Um, the way that Body for the Pile, which is actually a, 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 an older track of theirs, resurrected here, uh, is kind of given new life with the addition of, of layers of this kind of ear-piercing noise from the noise artist's sickness just gives it so much more... Um, that ugly kind of it's 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 the kind of noise music that doesn't just kind of make your ears hurt it makes you feel like ill in your stomach yeah and and that's the best like the most effective um noise music i think is the music that does that um really there are like and then you've got like uh two particular um rap features on this record that really stand out as just incredibly well deployed and just uh adding so much to the atmosphere of the record and that is of course um cam and china's contribution to 96 nev campbell cam in particular has an incredible verse uh on this track um that um the the city and i also like this is a chance for me to note as well the way that that this record mirrors the first half like the, this record mirrors uh existed in addiction to blood in certain ways like neve campbell is kind of like this album's equivalent of run for your life on that record with um in terms of the portrayal of kind of like the the um violent female character exacting uh, mayhem and and the way that that is portrayed is really really fun uh, but also terrifying um and then obviously she bad is another kind of example of that as well that 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 references that um and the other might be my favorite feature on this record and actually probably my favorite track on this album is um looking like meat uh which features a, it's just it's just one of the most blistering balls to the wall ear scraping and just violent pieces of music that clipping have ever done and it has an incredible feature from other noise rap pioneers horror as well and, and just everything about this song is just my shit completely i adore this fucking song it's so gritty Rich. and just ugly and and stomach churning um uh i i adore that and and then there are kind of like more uh minimal moments on the record as well where the the production shops of um where the production shops of the dual producers william hudson and jonathan snipes really come to the fore like they're uh they're all over this record in a really kind of showy and, and, and thrilling way, but like on something like something underneath, for example, where you just have oh. like, where you just have this propulsive energy, despite the fact the track is actually quite minimal. Um, and perhaps their finest hour, which is on pain every day, which I think even though looking like meat is my, like, you know, my personal favorite on the record for the way that it hits me, pain every day might be the most impressive accomplishment of the album in terms of the way that you just have layers of all this dense shit happening on this track and it all just comes together so perfectly uh the other track on this record as well that is uh, equally impressive in terms of uh the way that it branches out clipping sound as well as just being one of their most addictive tracks ever is uh enlacing uh oh, the penultimate track love here, that which, song. um it does not surprise me that they packaged pain every day and enlacing together into a single music video which they just posted recently uh which i highly recommend <laughs> because david is shirtless in it um but <laughs> but um enlacing in, in enlacing in particular is just this it's like you think this band has pulled out 
everything from their bag of tricks in terms of what they can do stylistically. And then you hear the hook on enlacing and it's like, holy shit, this is like everything. They were trying to do this kind of thing on their self-titled record, I think. And it just didn't always yeah, quite I, land. Um, the song tonight very specifically is yeah. very, very, very similar, but the execution here is so, so much, much more better. refined. Like, like tonight is, is, is one of my least favorite clipping tracks, but enlacing is one of my favorites. Um, and it's yeah, exactly. A much more successful execution of what they're trying to do there. Um, uh, because because David just rides this gorgeous vocal sample loop, and it and ugh, it just sounds so good. And also, I think there's lo- references to, to Lovecraft in the lyrics here. It's like the climactic yep. point of the record. It's very, um, yeah, great. It's just so great. sticky too. You just uh, yeah. get your ass down in the club. And I also I also love the um, I love the paranoid mob boss narrative of check the lock as well. Like it's oh, just, that mm. song fucking whips. Yeah, oh, yeah. I love that song. That, that again, August. You've touched on how talented David is in terms of storytelling, and would not. And uh, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that that is the biggest strength of every clipping record. It's not something that's just been yep. adopted here. The storytelling across all their records is is superlative. And here and on this track particularly, it's like wow, you're just hanging on every word. Um, and it's just and uh, just so fucking impressive. Um, uh, the like I've already re- referenced the music concrete of of Eaten Alive, which really took me aback the first time I heard. Um, the album because it's like wow you're really like you're not just kind of because in the past they've kind of adopted um these kind of like this kind of music concrete style as a bit of an aesthetic they toy with alongside other mm. elements in their music but here it's just full on they're not re- that's the focus of the track it's still got verses from david but um in terms of the instrumental that's it's just this clattering chaotic assembly of of of, of sounds and and uh, it's really like fuck. You're really going for it here, and it just and it ends up being one of my favorite tracks, to be honest, because yeah. I just admire the sheer uh, gutsiness of it. Um, and I already kind of alluded to the noise assault of um, Body for the Pile, but I mean it's worth acknowledging here that it is a delightfully twisted and deliriously fun fantasy about torturing and murdering cops. Um, it's explicitly that's what it's about their deaths are we, we all need it this year their buddy. deaths are described in gory detail and it is one of the most cathartic pieces of music this year has brought us even though it's not from this year it's just the decision to resurrect it and recontextualize it on an album here so smart and it just like ah, oh, you really you really um <laughs> yeah they really did that like this is an album that to be honest as much as i love um uh say the name and nev campbell and uh make them dead this is an album that kind of gets better as it goes i think like the second half of this record in particular is just interludes aside i cannot fault a single track in the second half of this record even minorly like pain every day check the lock looking like meat uh fucking eaten alive body for the pile and enlacing are just six of the best songs they can sequence a (laughs) fucking record like they're just flawless um yeah and and then secret pieces are really kind of like uh disarming but meaningful ending like it's like the calm after the storm uh it's like the whole experience of, of blood and then bodies is like this lengthy horror movie that goes through all these twists and turns. And at the end, it's like the sun is rising. You can hear the birds chirping and you've survived. You are the final girl, basically, at the end of this record who has made it through through the horrors that has been presented to you. And it's just such a an eerie ending to this record. Like, even though there's there's very little about it that is explicitly unsettling, I find it deeply troubling. Um, and it's just a perfect ending to this record. Um, yeah, just amazing stuff. I can't wait to, to hear from, from Jake and Sersha more about digging into this because I, yeah, I, I, I have not been able to stop listening to this for a, a lot of this the past week. Yeah. That's so, so like, in, it's so indicative of like just clipping are able to do this thing where they are just able to make such a harsh 
fucking dense, overpowering album and listening to it begins to feel like fucking heroin. It is just like, no matter how hard, whatever direction they go or how weird they can get, it is, I just want it to inject it into my fucking veins. And yeah. I mean, in that, I mean, that respect... I just want to say that leads really well into what I have to say. And I also think I'd be a really bad person to go last for this oh, okay. re- review, if that's okay. Yeah, no. okay. So, well, fuck you. So, um, Clipping's you. album, uh, There Existed an Addiction to Blood, was my favorite album of 2019. Um, and I think it is just one of my favorite uh, rap albums ever. Um, I think that Visions of Body Being Burned is, if anything, better. Um, it has both mo- a more consistent hooky, uh, like, pop appeal and a more consistent abrasiveness that's just so consistently rough and noisy. And yes, it channels your music and crap and noise music. Um, I was watching the clipping What's in My Bag episode they did for Amoeba Records. Um, and they not only bought out a lot of very classic hip hop records, but like music on crack records, harsh wall noise records, very obscure art house electronic records. And you can hear all of that in this. Um, Cause this is such a hooky, sticky record with so many, just Devi digs his flow. I could listen to it all day. He just doesn't break sweat rapping better than like almost anyone else doing it at the moment with just so much technical skill to the point where he could read the phone book and it would like there'd be a hook every 10 minutes or every like 10 seconds um and then the music uh that his producer the other two members of the band provide only make it more severe um it opens with uh intro um which, yeah, has these huge threatening blasts of music. Um, and then the music drops out and it builds up again and it sounds like the noise is coming for me in my home. Um, Say the name is, um, of course, it's fucking amazing. Um, especially at the beginning, they're playing with uh, uh, syncopating the synths on the rhythm in very interesting ways to create a sense of unease. Um, before they get into really noisy stuff. Um, like the, the synth line on Say the Name, um, it, it's like I'm, I'm in like a dreamscape horror film and nothing makes sense and it's terrifying. Um, but also I will very happily sit down with popcorn and watch this horror film um, and just get drunk and have a good time, if that makes any sense at all. Um, no, I feel you. Um, I love the line. I love the phrase that gives the title of the album, Candlesticks in the Dark, Visions of Bodies Being Burned. Because it's like, uh, it's just such an evocative image and it's delivered with such passion. Um, and um, it's mixed in such a, a troubling way. Um, yeah, um, it, it goes into like full on beautiful electronic chaos by the end. Um, but really effectively blending these very noisy elements and the willingness to just make a bop. Um, 96 and Eve Campbell uh, featuring Cam and China. Uh, Cam and China are really the attraction to this song. Their verses are face melting, to be frank. Um, it ha- again has quite a complex rhythm and very inventive beats. Um, at one point, using the sound of a blade unsheathing itself as a rhythmical element. Um, just to give you an idea of what uh, the music is doing. Something Underneath is uh, one of my favorite songs on the record. Um, again, David is just an amazing technician with his voice. Um, v- vomiting apocalyptic lyrics of like five, five words a second. Um, and just these, uh, you get these glitches coming in, uh, disassociating you, coming in a very jagged moment um, until the drums come in and it's just going, it's 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 building you up and building you up and building you up, and then it stops and he keeps rapping and then it starts building up again. And it is just 
one of the most visceral experiences I've had with music this year. Um, I would be surprised if it wasn't in my top 10 with visceral musical experiences at the end of the decade. We're only in the first year of the decade. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> Make Them Dead is, is quite harsh noise with these very haunting chants. Um, one of the most actively scary songs on the record. Um, again, um, <clears throat> she bad uses like squawking muted brass instruments as um, to build the beats with, and it just feels slightly unhinged, like it might leap out of your speakers and strangle you at any minute. Um, it's just crazy, and you get these um, tick 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 ticks in the background that feel like um, in John Carpenter's Halloween theme, where they start bringing that constant percussion element with their electronic hi hats. Um, this really drives the song forward. I feel like um, I've been given PTSD because when you say tick, tick, tick like that, I'm just waiting for James Hetfield to say talk. Oh, I want to no. die. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Tick, tick, you know what talk, would be cool friend. is if, is if, well, maybe not cool, but it would, be really, <laughs> it would be really funny if Clipping like interpolated some St. Anger lyrics on one of their albums. They would. They fucking they would. would. That would be, I want, I want. Metallica to make a rap metal album. Do you? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh okay. no. Anyway, after She Bad, we get our second interlude, it's, which I actually really like. I really love this interlude, um, Invocation. I love the way it uses uh, things that sound like glass resonances, where you'll like, uh, put your finger along the edge of a glass yeah. uh, to build a sonic palette here it's just really um i understand whether you want to want to flesh it out to a whole song but it's a wonderful musical idea um pain every day oh boy pain every day um but i feel like i could have that reaction to like every song on the album um it i wrote my notes it's what it's like to have your brain transplanted with a computer and feel every moment um some Again. I have no mouth and I must scream yeah, shit. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> it is also a bop. Um, like, this album, more consistently than Direction to Blood, has abrasive and pop appeal next to each other at all times. Um, and I just, I love the way it builds back up with strings at the end. It's just such a genius uh, thing to do, to lend another sonic palette, to lend another emotional level to the record. Um, that I don't think anyone but in, else in any other moment would think to do it. And it just brings a whole nother level to the record. Um, again, check the lock. There's, there's lyrics about uh, putting gin bottles in people's faces to disfigure them. Um, it has this uh, kind of like 80s synthwave feel, which is much more prevalent on the last record, much more infrequent here. So when it comes up here, it's almost like respite in what is still quite a hellish experience. Um, and it, again, just a very wonderful flow, uh, looking like meat. Uh, yeah, nobody cares about your bars. Uh, your screams are the only thing we want to hear, being a key lyric to this song. God, do I love it. Um, the feature is also outstanding and aggressive, and the production is on point. Um, yeah, um, I was a bit troubled by the cow samples on Drove. Not sure why they're there. I don't know why Mooing is on this album. Um, but yeah, Eaten and Alive. Great Toby Hooper film. Um, but I love the guttural growls that Davy does here. I love that they are embracing that music and credit aesthetic. Um, yeah, and it's... God, it just... The lyrics about leaving brains for cats to eat. This is so brutal yes. and horrific. Uh, and again, Body for the Pile uses just these noise beats as rhythmic elements. Um, and it's just, you are being oppressed by the thing that is the pop appeal at once. Um, just conjures up this aftermath of carnage and it's oppressive. And it it does make you feel like you are just another body for the pile. Like the, 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 the song has murdered you and you're being, and you're being put in a mass grave. And you, you're happy that they did it. Um, and the last song um, just reaches levels of transcendence that I just didn't expect. Um, it is 
the pinnacle of the record at the end. And it's not like other records where you're like, well, why did you put this at the end? It's the best thing on the record. It's like the record is built to it and always been great doing it. So when you get just the electronic bathes of warmth and just hellish transcendence of get your ass down to the floor. It's just, I do feel like this is the climax of an amazing horror film where I've reached the other side of terror. Um, Like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Martyrs. Like I have just pushed through the pain barrier of fear and now I am dancing in blood. Um, And then- Beginning of Blade type beat. Honestly, honestly, Blade, the movie, is quite a good companion piece of this record in many ways. Imagery-wise, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, um, I wasn't a fan of the concept art, art at the end of the last record, because it was just too long for me to care. Um, and the one at the end of this one is, is more interesting and shorter. So I fucking love this record. If it's not my top 10 at the end of the year, I will be shocked. It's just incredible, amazing. I have no more superlatives. I don't have enough superlatives to compliment it. And I'll hand over to Jake because I need to go to the toilet. Well, I'm a very in a very similar position as Sersha as uh, in its respective year. Uh, there existed an addiction to blood was my number two record that year. And honestly, like the fact that it wasn't number one was a bona fide fucking miracle. Um, so I was a little worried at first that this would be just kind of more of the same I suppose and even if it was more of the same I still probably would have liked it because you know they don't miss uh and instead we get a a perfect continuation I think I will start off and preface by saying I am in the the very very small minority of people it seems that do in fact prefer their exist existed an addiction to blood um just because I, I feel that that record in I do feel like you should consider them as like a double album in respect. Like that is the best way to experience this as it was meant to be experienced. And as such, I feel that the, this is the harsher, noisier record and there existed an addiction to blood is sort of what eases you into that. It's sort of something that gets you acclimated and as a a result becomes more consistent because of it. Um, But then again, I do also feel like comparing the two uh, is pointless in a way, just because they are part of the same project and because uh, each of them has such a distinct identity that it allows them to have their own very um, specific strengths and weaknesses. And as such, uh, the record starts off with it just booms to life amidst a sea of very quiet ambience like you're in some sort of dilapidated abandoned factory and you hear a a quiet slumbering leviathan monster slowly waking up and rising from the earth and there's these metal scrapes and creaky pipes that fill sort of the empty space in the mix as the booming slowly gets louder and louder and closer and closer and then there's the sampled and processed scream that kicked off the last record and introduces David on here uh whose flow is immediately like on fire it starts off being clunky but with every single um line it just gets smoother and smoother and faster and faster switching up on every single bar rhyme schemes and speed uh as well um and each second just passes and then it just explodes into static where we kick off things properly with say the name and Immediately, we get references to horror and horror films with the title, um, more overt references to Candyman and other hellish creatures uh, having their names evoked. Uh, David is cold and steady on this track, showing off how versatile he is, guiding us through a story about a woman who attempts to escape her life using partying, sex, and drugs. And through these pursuits, she's eventually seduced by a supernatural force that is impregnated by that force, uh, which alludes to being demonic demonic calling to mind horror movies like rosemary's baby um the beat and refrain of candlesticks in the dark visions of bodies being burned burned gives the song a great rhythmic pace uh the beat gets noisier and noisier and more cluttered as it continues and overwhelms until the end has bells synths metallic striking general chaos 
even developing a slightly funky industrial tinged groove at the end that I really, really love. Just fucking kicks down the door incredibly well, just like the start of the last record did. Um, the Witchboard interlude, um, I'm never one for interludes and skips with uh, in skits with hip hop, um, but clipping do occasionally earn a pass for me because of how much thought is put into them and because sometimes they're very brief, full of character. They set the stage for the next song uh, like they do here. It's a very cheeky and fun building of imagery of girls messing around with a Ouija board and conjuring up some malcontent spirit that cleverly being embodied by the next song. Um, these build the core concepts of the record in an endearing way and mostly do not overstay their welcome. Uh, 96 Nev Campbell, fucking amazing song. Uh, features on pretty much every clipping record I find are a delight. But here, probably the best they've ever been. Um, like as good as stuff like the Benny the Butcher uh, feature on the last one. Um, Cam and China appear on this with a very sickly but still smooth kind of flow. And uh, David just sort of allows the song to belong to them more than him. And uh, considering the title, I think that's appropriate. It's an allusion to Nev Campbell's character in Scream. Uh, I love the sampled knocking and gasps, the knock, knock, knock. <gasps> and it just, oh, I just, it, it's euphoric every time I hear that shit. And it just, it's, it makes you feel like you're watching a horror movie, but one where the tables have turned and where the final girl is actually the killer. It's a brag rap song, not about materialism, but how its subject is going to violently murder you. Uh, underneath, I fucking love because it just, it builds from the first track's very slow, or the intro track's slow but lumbering nature is the jagged hits of static in this song, in the beat, make it feel like you're watching the video from The Ring and you're gonna die. <laughs> and David's absolutely insane, wicked flow guides you along a beat that becomes more and more industrial and heavy and distorted. And the imagery here is just, it's, it's, even divorced from like stuff on the first album, it's terrifying. Conjuring to mind some ancient Lovecraftian beast that forms from undead flesh and sewer trash rising from the earth to create this terrifying titan that was once underneath but has now been given form, which goes great into Make Them Dead, which is an eerie, ominous track that starts off like it wants to fucking deafen you bringing back uh, Clipping's love of abrasion in their beats. David is basically rapping over a fucking Merzbow track when this starts and manages to do so flawlessly. Motherfucker glides over beats like he's Danny Brown. And the imagery here is, is mystical and cult-like. The female vocal harmonies on the dead, just, oh, it's, it's so fucking chilling. And the narrative of it makes it feel like I'm watching one of the rituals from the end of Midsummer if it was directed by Rob Zombie. David's poetic recount of what it's like to be indoctrinated and born into a cult and the mentality that arises from that, which could also be seen as allegorical to the hateful and toxic political ideologies of 2020. Um, it's unhinged in the best of ways. Uh, she Bad relents from the merciless onslaught of harsh noise that the last track had and sort of evens out on just a straight banger about a ghostly spirit in the woods who lures people to their death and uh, more industrial ambience and sampling of sound effects. Um, specifically from The Evil Dead, you sort of hear the, um, the, that sound that's sort of iconic to that franchise sort of permeating the beat here. Uh, there's an air of tragedy here that is uh, imbued onto the stories of this record as a whole and addiction, uh, where David will interject these little bits of character building to the protagonists of these songs, talking about their home life, their dreams, their aspirations, right before subjecting them to untold, unspeakable horror, making them feel really fleshed out and taken advantage of and getting you emotionally involved with these narratives. Um, and both of these albums are just full of that, which is what makes them special. It just doesn't like do it for the sake of doing it. You actually really get the impression that they like took the time and care to make this a, a fully formed thing. Uh, which then it goes into the invocation interlude, which is noisy, knocking, and uh, just eventually delivers into the frigid flow that goes into the next song of Pain Every Day, which 
Some of the best lyricism on the record shows up here. It's a relentlessly cruel story about someone's life being lost to unjust violence and the ambivalence of the world uh, to this lost life. The beat here occasionally becomes so mechanical and cycling, it sounds like it's plucked from an IDM song. And as always, Diggs rides this beat like he was born for it. Uh, uh, just a it's... Point, of, uh, point of comparison on the IDM mm. reference there, I believe the beat is uh, kind of a throwback to, or not necessarily a throwback to, but an homage to Venetian Sneers, who are an IDM act that I have mentioned in the past. And it's very much yes. kind of like a drum and bass or drill and bass kind of influenced beat. Yeah, absolutely. It's It sounds right out of that. And it's just as chaotic, which makes David's ability to ride the beat all the more impressive. Uh, and it's combined later in the song with these really haunting strings at the end that make this like hectic hellscape. We and weirdly what that com contrast and development reminds me of, even though the song doesn't really sound like it. It just reminds mm -hmm. me of um, Machine Gun by Porter's Head. Just the way that it's, it has Ooh. this kind of cold beat, but then it introduces these kind of strange uh, ethereal sounds towards the end that you just weren't expecting. Um, I, I can see that. Just a random thought I had while I was No, I, I actually totally agree with that. And it matches the fact because the narrative of the song, especially in the last part of it, uh, sort of becomes about the departed person taking vengeance on a world that forgot them, ending on those like really somber strings as the rest of the song just sort of disappears. Uh, check the lock. What a fucking banger. This one really reminds me of uh, Club Down from the previous record, which is sort of where it just sort of stops and becomes this just obscenely aggressive song that just fucking you you play this in your car to fucking trunk knock to it and uh it details the story of a criminal who's losing his mind to paranoia because of his lifestyle which is genuinely anxiety inducing with the amount of detail here the beat is vast and sweeping distant echoing bells cradling this hard-hitting beat like a philip glass instrumental combined with an industrial machine it's a flat banger that probably shouldn't work but the unique combination just sort of makes it work it's the fact that the production is so tight here that it like anyone else would make this an absolute fucking mess uh, looking like meat sputtering harsh caustic beat combined with the beautiful and downright graceful hits of ambient sound make this great incredible contrast even more idm influence on this one too on some of the beats harsher moments but the refrain has these bright, twinkling, almost Ryuichi Sakamoto-esque moments that make you feel like you're in some kind of demonic cathedral. The song just explodes into utter madness with each progressing verse, feeling like it's heavy enough to fucking flatten you by the time it's over. Uh, drove, the interlude, not crazy about. Kind of like Sersha, just doesn't add a lot to me. But again, it's not particularly long, so, you know, fucking whatever. Uh, Eaten Alive. This song harkens back to the one on uh, Addiction that sort of had a beat constructed purely from like the ambient city life sounds where they actually had part of the beat playing in a car that they recorded by driving David rapping over it as it passed by and he adjusted his flow to um, be in time with it the further it got away, um, which makes it really impressive here too. It's... Um, this seems to be sort of this like rusty swamp house and like a serial killer's butchering cabin. It's a most, it's like the most mechanical sounding song on the record. Um, like, I do you say like a butchering cabin, like literally I think of like Texas Chainsaw Massacre when I yes. listen to it. And obviously, Precisely. obviously the title is a reference to a Toby Hooper film, a different Toby per, Hooper film. Yep. So that's clearly intentional. Which is also oh, yeah. a uh, film that uh, is referencing a real life serial killer. So that's always nice. Yeah, all comes together. Um, however, I do find the repeated hook here to be just the slightest bit labored. And while interesting as the beat progresses and eventually becomes this wall of cascading, cluttering metal smashing, uh, the song itself feels just like a bit too discordant for its own good, but it never, it doesn't keep me from enjoying the creativity on display. It just feels just a slightest bit too messy and could have benefited, at least I think, from reining itself in a bit, but that might be just my uh, preference for the, the slightly more reined sure. in and controlled uh, nature that was displayed on their existent addiction to blood. It's, it's a 
good song. It's just the one that has the most moments where I'm just like, I, I, I just feel like this could have been, could you could have used that tightening, I suppose. I get um, that, definitely. Um, I obviously, yeah. I obviously don't agree. I think it's perfect, but I do get that. Another yeah. comparison that came to mind when I was listening to that track is um, 93 Avenue B Blues from yeah. Lance's The mm-hmm. Seer. Uh, as well that is a another great that example a, of that a very similar thing i think with in terms of like oh music yeah concrete evocation of chaos and hell um mm-hmm. yeah good stuff um yeah and after that we get body for the pile which is another noisy banger uh metallic hits contrast with the clunky booming in the background leave room for david to just kind of set the scene uh more of the cruelty and inherent nihilism uh, that's in more than just the title, uh, but it's cleverly reversed here. The feeling of lives being lost is uh, to police violence specifically and wasted life in general is turned around as it's the cops who are now being shot, killed, and brutally murdered. Uh, now them just becoming more bodies for the pile, an insanely cathartic listen considering the landscape and climate of 2020. The Veed's really animated here and theatrical for most of this, but then breaks out a flow faster than a fucking bullet train in the final third as the sound of sirens start blaring as if we're listening to like a nuclear reactor melting down uh this feeling just kind of permeates the whole record and i find this album in general seems to be more focused on large-scale disaster and horror which is a clever way to separate it from the last record i think because it felt a little bit more focused and personal and more geared to being the experience of one personal person of, of one specific person whereas this one feels like a shared experience feels like a mass hysteria of an album uh which i think is a a great way to progress into it and then we have enlacing which oh holy shit uh enlacing is sort of the spiritual successor to a song on an earlier clipping record tonight um as the sonic ideas and even the delivery are very very similar but this time it's under a very different lens and it's also executed far more skillfully in my opinion um, the song is about to get totally, uh, getting totally fucked up on drugs and alcohol to avoid the terror of the real world and its heavy synths and heavy vocal processing and very surreal lyricism and dance beat make it a wonderful way to close the record. It's nearly psychedelic and the smoothness of the production leads me to prefer the execution uh, here than it was on tonight. It's a titanic sounding song that has David encompass most of the themes on the record, uh, both of them in fact, uh, about helplessness and escape and there's just something so terrifyingly haunting about that and each time the chorus comes it just explodes to sound bigger and bigger and more overwhelming than it did the last time and then we have of course secret peace uh the final bit uh an interpolation of a musical concept uh an industrial take on yoko ono's secret peace Uh, as a bit of ambience it sort of grows into sounding like this beautiful peaceful morning with a chirping crickets and birds um it's just a really good little piece and it seems to be the waking up from the darkness and nightmare of the final two records which i think is made more effective if you listen to them uh together because it's this like really long experience and then you get this sort of breather at the end like if i can build off of the comparison to um that tyler made to the seer it's kind of like it serves the purpose that song for a warrior serves on that record where it's just like you have been fucking assaulted for like an hour and a half and so here's five minutes of respite before we go into the last segment except it's sort of just an ending and just overall upon first glance I think it's easy to just sort of dismiss visions here of being more than uh, a compilation of of their existed and addiction to the blood b-sides but besides being provably untrue um these songs here have the level and care and polish that the other ones did in droves Um, I don't think that saying that this is like a compilation of other songs, uh, even if you were to just, you know, be incorrect on that, is is a fair assessment at all. And even if you want to say that this is like a, um, I have heard some people say that this is just sort of like, just sounds like the weaker tracks compiled onto a, a different album, which I wholeheartedly fucking disagree with. That's just inaccurate. Um, I, I think that if like, a lot of the songs here would have 
felt like slight outliers if they were put on addiction, as this does have an identity all its own. What sacrifices in the more direct, hard-hitting production that you'd find on things like Mala, La Mala Ordina or Club Down, it makes up for in the more adventurous and often ethereal sound play. There's several risks taken here, and even though when they don't always hit 100%, I'd say they are still willing to hit like 95% of the time, to the point where it doesn't fucking matter, um, the steady hand of Diggs incomparable lyricism and unparalleled technical talent keep this tethered to being an experience that is completely on par with its older brethren and every other clipping work to date. Just like that album, it contains everything that makes clipping clipping. The storytelling, the insanely creative off the beaten path production, plenty of creative ideas for their beats that the contemporaries simply aren't tapping into, whether it be sampling horror movie sound effects, mim mimicking the production style of a John Carpenter theme, going balls deep into an IDM beat that doesn't feel out of place somehow, using ambient noise to construct their own organic sound. It's all astonishing. And even with their level of popularity, I think the entirety of this group still doesn't get the recognition that they deserve. David, in my opinion, for whatever that is even worth, is maybe the best MC to ever fucking do it. And basically shits gold with everything he does. Songs like Make Them Dead and Enlacing are practically uncharted territory for this band and what they've been doing for the past decade. And they pull it off effortlessly as if they've been doing it the entire time. Um, it excites me for the potential future of this musical project because I don't know what they're going to do next or even what they're capable of. While I deem this just such a slightly less consistent listen, that evaluation is only marginal. I'll admit that it could just be because of my enthusiastic love for addiction that I've been listening to it nonstop since it came out that puts it above it, but I'm happy to say that this project is both a worthy clipping project and a worthy sibling uh, album to its other project. Uh, it's astonishing, it's terrifying, it's poignant, it's poignant, it's meticulously crafted, and it blends Clipping's grassroots approach to beats, their self-aware attitude, and their love and appreciation for horror, just like on Addiction. It makes it all feel socially relevant and poignant, as these monsters mm -hmm. that they talk about are all emblematic of the fear of the marginalized in a tumultuous political time. Mm -hmm. To be scary. Especially when you're be... referencing Lovecraft. The yes. Whole people. To be scary, to be self-aware, to be political, but to also be cheeky enough to make the album an invigorating and exciting listen is such a tight, tightrope to walk. One mm -hmm. that I think anyone who is less than the best at what they do couldn't pull off. Yet, Clipping have done just that. And not only that, but they've done it for the second time in a row. Visions of Bodies Being Burned is a ferocious, untamed beast of industrial horrorcore hip-hop. It is a dense, exciting listen that captivated me, just like their other records have, but in lots of ways I didn't expect. Just when I think this group is done surprising me and that they're done evolving, they empirically prove me wrong. It's the kind of record that makes Enduring 2020 feel almost worth it, as it means the, uh, this album can go into my permanent rotation from here on out. God bless the red. Love it. Great. Great. Great review. Um, so that we don't forget, uh, Morgan has actually supplied us yeah. with his review, um, yeah. which I will now read. Um, it's quite short. Our resident review reader, Tyler. I'm happy to do yes. it. Um, so, in Morgan's words, uh, to say that Clipping's visions of bodies being burned is a towering achievement would be to sell it short. All at once, the experimental hip-hop group managed to craft the best horror experience of the year, deliver a rich, penetrative, and deeply rewarding examination of oppression through the lens of horror and slasher tropes, and surpass this album's pre pre predecessor and counterpart last year's There Existed an Addiction to Blood. To such a degree that if that album were even a fraction less sharp than it is, it would be rendered inert. I won't carry on for very long here, as I'm sure my comrades have elaborated in great detail as to why this album uh, is so incredible, but just know that I co-sign pretty much every positive thing they might have to say about it. Uh, the only negative thing I have to say about it is that I find the interlude witchboard to be awkwardly placed. Uh, I think the pacing would have been improved by going from Say the Name straight into 96 Neve Campbell and just maintaining the momentum started on the former. But, 
Even then, 30 seconds of semi-awkward pacing do not even approach properly diminishing my appreciation for this album. It is an absolute must-listen for 2020. Uh, and mm. yeah, I agree with most of that. I do want to say that um, I feel like maybe I'm the only one here or one of the only ones here, but I actually quite like the placement of Witchboard. Yeah, uh, I, I feel, like it too. It leads I, into I that have, song really well. I have one note on where I wish, a way I think it could have been improved and would have been, I would have had no problem with it. If instead of saying he is here, I wish it said she is here. Yeah. Because that would be a more kind of sharp transition. There. Yeah, that's a good one. Funnily note. enough, on the vinyl, there are no interludes. They are cut. So, oh, yeah. I think I remember that being true for the previous album as well. Yeah, so if you, if you want to listen to them in that format, the vinyl is there. So, so Excellent. I, that, that just tells me that the band allow thinks that's a valid experience of the album so yep. that, yeah yeah exactly and, and yeah okay all right so, let's, yeah. let's do our favorite tracks and ratings um, oh, yeah. oh god jake you can lead us off we'll go in our regular order oh favorite tracks how do i even begin um i'm going to say my favorite tracks are enlacing uh enlacing underneath and check the lock um lots of good songs i had to leave off that's it's just like the last record it's painful um my least favorite track is again um eaten alive uh still a good song i still enjoy it uh, it's just one that i more appreciate more than i actively like um which i guess is inevitable with this kind of stuff and i'm going to give the record a 9.5 out of 10. august love to see it Okay, my three favorite tracks here, I would have to say, uh, Say the Name, oh boy, probably in a lacing, and I'll go for uh, Pain Every Day. My least favorite would be the Witchboard Interlude, and I would give this album, because I could see this jumping up half a point someday, an 8.5. I love that. The powerful August 8.5. Okay, I'll give you Morgan's... um, The Fellini special. Yeah, I'll give you Morgan's now. I hate you. Um, Morgan's three favorite tracks are uh, Check the Lock, Body for the Pile, and Looking Like Meat. Uh, And Morgan actually... She has good taste. Yeah, Morgan actually picked an interlude for least favorite, so he kind of cheated, but he picked a (laughs) witchboard. Um, And Morgan gives the album uh, an effusive 9.5 also. Ooh, my God. Am I going to be the only one giving full marks? Spoiler. Um, I don't so, know. Are you? I, am I? I don't know. So, are you? That's not for me to answer. Um, yeah. So my favorite tracks are Say the Name, um, uh, the, the, Something Underneath, and Pain Every Day. I don't have a least favorite track, and I'm giving the album a 10 out of 10. Oh, what do you know? He did it. I did um, do it. I said that do it all fucking week. Here we are. <laughs> so I so my three favorite tracks are um, Looking Like Meat, Pain Every Day, and Enlacing. Uh, my least favorite track, if I had to pick one, uh, I guess if I had to pick one, I'd maybe say She Bad. Um, and I've really toiled this week over whether to give this a 9.5 or a 10. Um, because it's like when you discount the interludes and it's actually especially encouraging to know the vinyl edition discludes them uh, even yeah. even she bad I like a lot um, and so there's really nothing on here that I consider a weak point so it's this weird position where it's like um, there's nothing I dislike even remotely about the album but I feel strange because to me I can't I struggle to separate it from the from the previous record mm. um, so uh, I'm going to say that uh, if I'm rating the two albums as one sort of cohesive project, that it's uh, uh, a 10 out of 10 project, if they're together. Uh, but I'm going to give Visions a 9.5. Uh, just because I, I agree with that assessment entirely, actually. Just because to me, uh, even though I think that um, it, on its own, I, I think Visions is slightly stronger than blood even though i think that 
when you kind of combine them together as a holistic experience, and I did try this out the other night. I listened to yeah, I made both, a playlist. I listened to them both back to front, and I was just really stunned by how well they worked together as this kind oh, of yeah. like two hour, even with piano burning in the middle. Uh, I was mm-hmm. really kind of um, yeah. So I think that as a kind of holistic project in the way that they intended originally to release it, it's perfect. Um, but it. I just don't like the fact that they're broken up. So it's a 9.5 uh, for entirely stupid reasons. Um, I mean, but, yeah. that's fair, but it is still, on average, a 9.4 rating. And Whoa. For context, Deftones. Wow. Yeah, for context, Deftones' as ohms was a 9.5. So, so we're, we're, it's pretty good. Uh, it's very satisfying when we get a con- consensus love, love mm-hmm. react like that. It has happened three times in the week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I that's awesome. So. Um, all right. So all right. Uh, let's move on now to our second new release of the day. Interestingly enough, a fun little factoid: both of the artists we're covering today uh, were covering their second release across the span of a year. Yeah. So that's yeah, actually yeah. quite cool. Uh, and Sersha, you can introduce it and contextualize it. Yeah. So um, I talked about the last Mountain Goats 2020 record on the first episode of this podcast. Um, which was fun. But um, Mountain Goats, my favourite band. As I said in the episode, they'll be up tomorrow. Well, yesterday when you're watching this. Um, indie folk, indie rock, occasionally lo-fi outfit from California. Founded by John Daniel in 1991, I want to say. Um, yeah. Uh, they are my favourite band. I'm not going to make any bones about this. Um, I, was, I was quite nervous going into this, their 19th record. Um, because... Uh, the last couple of records haven't exactly been the most accessible uh, cuts. I wasn't a huge fan of Goths, which was our last record to receive massive acclaim. Um, and so it was in the middle of the binge of records we did uh, for the West Fest that I first listened to this. And I listened to Walking Across the Park. And as soon as Get Famous kicked in, I was like, okay. And then Picture of My Jazz, which I'd already heard, happened. I was like, okay, I am going to really, really fuck with this record. And I did. I think um, that this record, it's their mo- It's my favorite record they've done since Beat the Champ. I think it's the most accessible record they've done since Transcendental Youth. Um, and yeah, the fact that it's an hour long and it's their second record of 2020, and their first record was clearly made by John out of not being able to record this album. Um, yeah, God, this is just, I think it's really good. And every single record they've ever made has really improved to me uh, just sitting with it over the course of a few months. So I dare to think what I'm going to think of this record eventually. Um, but yeah, uh, this record is really fun. It's very throwback. Um, I got big sort of 70s kind of glam, kind of piano rock, Billy Joel type shit of this record. It's pastiching a lot of very old musical styles. It carries a lot of them off with a plum. And I think even when it decides to do the more typical Mountain Goats, um, melancholy, instrumentally experimental folk, it does that super, super well. And I, even though I think that what has plagued the last several Mountain Goats releases is just a bunch of inessential tracks that are still very interesting by themselves. Um, I think it really succeeds. And I think that this could be the first Mountain Goats record in in a while to really break into the mainstream, which is ironic considering the second track is Get Famous, which I believe is based around... um, It's a song about how their fandom wants them to be more famous than they are. You could be famous. I want you to be famous. And then the trumpets come in and it's... <sighs> Sufjan and it's, Stevens uh, type beat. <laughs> um, yeah. I really fucking dig this record. Um, so Get Famous is really, really, really fun. Um, I can. Tyler has said that he has some mixing issues with the record. I can see why. I think on some of the songs on this record, the guitars could be given better re-cueing um, and better mix and better leveling in the general mix. Um, but I, I can understand how that can happen when um, 
you all live in different states and you're making this record transferring your files between each other, recording in home studios, which is somewhat how this record was put together. Um, it, it sounds better than the song to Pierre Chauvin, which is a return to the boombox sound they did in 2020. Though I think that that record is still very excellent. Um, I think, I, I think this might be better. Um, anyway, uh, Get Famous, it's got these wonderful sort of, uh, almost like what you'd expect to find on a Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack type pastiche feel. Um, God, um, it's got a wonderful electric guitar work, um, just incredibly satisfying, very just balls to the wall. We're going to have fun on this song. Um, and it's just a, such a good time. Um, I, it's got a scream along chorus, which they don't do very often, but when they do, they do it so well. Um, and then leads into Picture of My Dress, which is more laid back, more stripped back, but also really fun. Um, a song about this sort of old lady just taking to the road and living her best life and being her best self. And she doesn't need to live up to anyone's standards because she has chosen a life where she can just uh, be who she wants to be. Um, and a lot of trans audiences actually have read their own subtext into this song. Um, especially seeing as a lot of trans people do live more vagrant lifestyles after being ejected from their family. Um, and finding pride in more gendered affectations like taking a picture of your dress, that kind of thing. Um, although I think that both narratives work superbly. Um, as many candles as possible continues a really strong opening run. Um, yeah, um, it's more brooding, more threatening. Um, it's got this rumbling bass and blown out guitars um, that almost, it almost feels like a more mature version of what they were doing on We Shall All Be Healed. Um, it's just got some amazing lyrics as well. It just feels very imposing. Um, yeah, Tidal Wave, um, again, it's more stripped back. It's got an amazing bass intro. Um, an almost barely mixed kick and floor tom combination before a proper drum line with the hi-hats and snares come in. Um, God, um, I love the refrain of not every wave is a tidal wave, which is a sentiment that in the current apocalyptic political and world and, and, and sanitary climate is a sentiment I think we can all deal with, that not every problem is insurmountable, I think is something we need to remember at the moment. Um, yeah, Pez Dorado. Um, I love the sound of this song. Um, it uses more minor keys and it builds a nostalgic, melancholy feeling. Um, the production is so polished without being extravagant. It just feels warm. It's, it, I would say it's maybe a hair too long, but in the scheme of things, even if this is a more insubstantial song on the record, I still love listening to it. Um, the last place I saw you live is um, in the Mountain Goats tradition of incredibly mournful tracks. Um, I love the opening chords. I love the musical theatre vibe to it. Um, it reminds me a lot of sort of what early Billy Joel sounds like. Uh, and I am very, very here for it. Um, yeah. Um, Bell Swamp Connection, a very troubling narrative of this boy goes out to a swamp with his father who gets caught in the swamp and we assume drowns, tells the son to get out. The son goes and lies on a rock and hides and then he hears other people fall into an identical story near him, unable to help them because of his um, many factors. Um, and it's a really troubling story, but it's told with this emotional sensitivity and beauty and really immaculate production. And when John shouts, get out, get out, it's just so, it satisfies my heart, you know, just so. Great song. Yeah, beautifully done. And then the, I think the next two songs with it form a, one of the best three track stretches they've done since Beat the Champ. Um, the, the Great Gold Sheep is um, this, uh, it helps to know that John is Catholic going into The Great Gold Sheep, um, seeing as how it uh, evokes the classical story of Moses out in the desert and his followers worshipping uh, false idols made out of gold. Um, and yeah, I'd love it. It's a song about being um, a tyrant or a tyrannical mythological figure and get, and bringing people under your wing 
Um, a lot of John's recent songwriting, which is very present on their last two albums as well, deals with our current political climate stoked in metaphor. Um, and I think this song is a great example of that. Um, on songs of Pierre Chauvin, you had a song like um, Until Olympus Returns, which positioned yourself as someone who serves under a tyrant and pays lip service to their empty words. Um, the final refrain of that song, you're just doing your bit until Olympus returns, um, evoking how you're working to try and achieve a non-existent mythological previous state. On Illegal Dragons, you had a song like, um, what's the closing called? Uh, Sicilian Crest, which gave you a lot of very empty symbols and encouraged you to follow them. In this song, though, you are positioned as the tyrannical dictator who has almost supernatural powers to raise the dead, the ending implies, saying that you approach um, a shallow grave among the reeds, wake up and worship the great gold sheep. Um, Rat Queen is ridiculous amounts of fun. Um, it's still very pastiche. Um, and I feel like they're not just embracing the pastiching of a genre, but actually embracing the genre and doing it justice with many of these songs. Um, I just, God, I love the song, New Dreams, New Dreams for the Rad Queen. Um, it's just amazing piano. The guitar solo on the outro is insane. Just The guitar leads all over the song are just God tier fun. Um, yeah, and uh, the piano again sort of evokes, it's like a musical theater, musical theater tradition um and i think at this time many of us myself included feel like rat queens who need new dreams um yeah um wolf count um and hard me are two songs i have less to say about but i think they're very pleasant wolf count has a very lovely piano intro and harbor me is just i love the way he very softly pleads harbor me just like i i need a hug give me a hug you know just hold me um and then getting into knives is is another of my favorite tracks an amazing closer in a long history of fantastic mountain goats closing tracks um yeah um i can't even though it's a pretty specific story about vengeance and about grief i can't help but feel like it does have current political resonance of how so many people are being driven to more um, extreme, radical, violent political, act political actions, just through anger more than anything else, through anger at the system and the people around you and people who've hurt you, especially um, in both the UK and America, a distinct mismanagement of a fucking pandemic murdering people we love, driving people to be angry at the way things are and seeking new way of doing things. I feel like the whole political system at the moment is getting into knives. And this song captures it in uh, beautiful hues. Um, I've reached the end of the track list, but I want to keep talking about this record because I'm very passionate about it. I just, ah, it's really, really fun. It is the most fun the Mountain Goats have been having on their records for maybe a decade. And it's just a musical sound I needed at the moment, especially from these people. It's just an insanely good time. I am definitely going to buy it on vinyl when I have the money. And I just, ah, oh, I love it. Awesome. You'll probably be able to bounce off some of the things that, that some of us say as well. Uh, sure. I'll go last though. Oh. August, why don't you go? Yeah, I was going to say, I suppose I can go because I, I have a relatively small amount of things to say uh as do i mainly that i i particularly enjoy tallahassee a fair bit obviously as we've reviewed it on this podcast i think that is quite a uh a good album so i uh I obviously do not have the context in their discography for like where this fall, like at least listening wise, I've not heard any of their other albums, bar this and uh, Tallahassee. Um, I guess just my my immediate thing here is I I personally find this album far less like emotionally impactful than Tallahassee and I get that's a bit of an unfair criticism because I'm compare 
I'm kind of weighing this record on that expectation. But I, I will be fair and say that is only for like the more melancholic, folky songs on here where I have that kind of expectation for some kind of big degree of emotional evocation. Although I did, I did notably find a picture of my dress uh, quite good in that regard. I thought that was a very evocative, nice song. I think Trisha has already done an excellent point of explaining just what that song is about, how how well it works. Um, uh, but but that aside, my my main thing here is I am just not a fan of when the mountain goats attempt this kind of rock pastiche. I didn't particularly care for it when they did it on that one on like one song on Tallahassee. I thought that was far and away the worst song on that record. And I just find myself consistently not really engaging with that sound from them because I just I just don't think Darnell's voice ever particularly tailors to like a a really rocked out sound very well. It I think he just works far better in a much lower key sound. Uh, and on top of that, I I must concur. I think a lot of the mixing here sounds very muddy, very sludgy, especially. Uh, what the song that sticks out like a sore thumb to me is like as many candles as possible which very poorly mixed very like muddy sounding i did not like that songs just the sound of it uh really overall i cannot say i particularly disliked what was going on here uh but i can't say i really was thumbs up for it. It's a situation where I'm very much left like this could do a lot of things for me, but I just it doesn't really. And that's it's it's a lot of personal preference stuff, but that's about all I have to really. I mean, say I here. I kind of saw this coming to be honest, because um, I I immediately resonated to this album, but I also felt like. I am going to be the only person on this planet who feels like this album was like written for them. Um, and it's partly because I have an affection for what they do anyway, I think. Um, and I'm just very excited to see them explore this ground. I see what you mean about John's voice, but I, I kind of love his voice in all contexts because I think he's an interesting singer. Um, uh, and yeah, I am not surprised that you or maybe other people in this podcast aren't gravitating to it as much as I am. Because only I am going to gravitate to this record as much as I did. No, I uh, I hold uh, nothing against you for that. No. That's fair enough. I, <laughs> yeah. All right, Jake, I'm curious about your thoughts. Uh, yeah. Um, I've only really become a fan of the Mountain Goats recently, and uh, I haven't listened to as many albums by them as I probably should have. Um, but we have covered Tallahassee on a previous episode of this podcast record that I fucking, mm -hmm. that I truly love, uh, which led me to finding All Hail West Texas, an album I love so much that I bought it on vinyl, and I think it's perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. And even though I wasn't too hot on their other record that I've heard, uh, Goths, um, I guess I just had slightly higher expectations now just because I know at the very least the heights of what they're capable of. Uh, whether or not that's unfair, I don't know. Um, but all that aside, it did lead me to feel slightly mixed here. Uh, biggest problem here is length. Uh, I just don't know why this is nearly an hour long. It's not that Darnell and co like can't sustain a record that long, but at a certain point, I just have to wonder what exactly it's in service of. Uh, Tallahassee and All Hail West Texas are records that tell these really compelling stories with great music. And Getting Into Knives is admittedly not trying to do what those records are doing. It is an album of songs. And as far as I can tell, there's no narrative there, which is fine. But that said, that makes the album feel really, really scattershot, especially when the production is so oddly varying from track to track, because some songs sound 
way too well produced and sanitized when I think they could benefit from like a grittier edge. Songs like Get Famous or The Great Gold Sheep, where I just, I, I really want an older mountain goat's sound here and I don't have that, which again, maybe it's a personal preference, I don't know. Um, and some of them just don't sound like they belong on a more polished studio record which I am assuming this is trying to be at all, like as many candles as possible and chorus can massive stride. Uh, this is all kind of a shame too, just because like as a whole, I like the record. I do think it is good and I like every song here to some extent. I'm just not truly sure how it all fits together for me. There are moments of uh, pure Mountain Goats style bliss that evokes that primal part of me that I love tapping into like on the heartbreaking the last place I saw you alive and the at least for me beautiful reassurance of a track like Tidal Wave which harbors a sentiment that I very very deeply identify with and not every wave is a tidal wave a lesson that my poor broken heart needs to fucking learn um, but I just can't help but feel that some trimming and some more consistency when it came to production could elevate this from being a good record to being a great one and I hate that considering how much I like some of the material material here because John Darniel is a great songwriter and genuinely I don't really think he could write multiple bad songs on a record just because his irreverent and wittiness and emotional honesty just usually leads to gold. Uh, it's a mixed bag that favors positivity for sure and I don't inherently dislike uh, the idea of a more studio sounding Mountain Goat sound. I just wish that the knives in question here were sharper so to speak. Mm -hmm. I don't know what anyone else on the pod feels about this uh, since we've all kept kind of quiet on it so I could see myself being an outlier yeah. of sorts, I mean, but I imagine... I mean, you, you know what, like, two of us feel about it yeah. already. <laughs> well, kind of. Um, but I imagine this will please longtime Mountain Goats fans as it's not a particularly, like, risky album and does play to a lot of the band's strengths. Uh, I do think it is a solid release. I just think that that means your, your mileage may vary. Sure. So. Um, if I could just comment on that very quickly, is that um, part of what is pleasing me is that I'm a long time Mountain Goats fan, but part of that is that I have like context for leading up to this in a way. It doesn't like I would recommend if you want to hear records that imply this record happening in the back catalogue, you've got uh, Beat the Champ, uh, Transcendental Youth, and We Shall All Be Healed. Mm -hmm. um, and all three of those records have multiple songs that are just really out to have fun and not a lot yeah. else. Um, mm -hmm. And they're all really good. I mean, with Beat the Champion, song like The Legend of Shavu Guerra, which is really fun, the celebration of a cult wrestling icon, but it's also about John's traumatic childhood at once, so maybe that's a grey area. But um, basically, uh, listening to this record, uh, either felt like they're doing what they do well and writing they've been threatening to do for a long time which is just having fun and i'm very open to both of those possibilities okay um so i guess i will jump in now so a little context um i have heard four mountain goats albums to date uh all hail west texas tallahassee we shall all be healed and the sunset tree notably for consecutive records from sort of their earlier period. So I haven't actually heard a full length uh, record from them since um, The Sunset Tree, which is 15 years ago. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, I likewise have, much like Jake and, and August, I don't have a lot of context for where this sits in um, John's career, although I have kind of, even though I haven't really like listened to uh, the albums he's made in the last decade, I have kind of followed the release of them and kind of absorbed the narrative around them and read reviews and that kind of thing, just because I've always found the Mountain Goats uh, interesting and I've always really responded to the four albums I have heard. And knowing that Search is going to, knowing Search's video is, is, is well, it's already out when you're watching this, but I won't get to see it until tomorrow when we record this. I'm very excited and I know for a fact it's going to prompt me to listen to every single one I haven't listened to yet. And that really excites me. Um, but I want to establish the fact that I have a not lot of context, um, like Jake and August, because um, I actually like this record quite a fucking bit. Um, I, I really enjoy it, actually. 
Um, and I wanted to go last because I figured that that um, um, Jake and August might be next, and so I wanted to kind of come and swoop in and 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 bring this a bit full circle a bit since Sersha led off with uh, such a positive review. Um, I don't. This, this real quick though, did Morgan did Morgan post a review for this or no? Uh, no, he has not. Uh, he's not listened to them I, to this record. I don't believe. Um, but anyway. Well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to kind of bring it full circle a bit. Now, I, I'm going to stay up front. Uh, I don't love it as much as Sersha does. Uh, I do have a few issues uh, with certain tracks, um, but I've listened to it three times now, and each time uh, I've liked it more than the previous time. Um, and and I have no reason to believe that that sort of upward trajectory won't continue to happen. Um, and, and that's really exciting to me. Um, so I've written a lot on this album, so I'm excited to get into it. Um, yeah, and so I'll just get started. Uh, the songwriting on this thing uh, is for the most part as smart and as thoughtful as it ever has been in my experience with the Mountain Goats um, and they as a band they're clearly at a point in their career where they have nothing to prove to anyone and they can focus well, John can focus solely on making resolutely solid lyric focused jaunty variations of folk rock um, the, the call to experimentalism and quirky musical diversions are comfortably behind them, or at least they're not a point of interest here. Um, and so getting into Knives has the feeling of an assured late period work, likely destined to be underrated or overlooked because it lacks the kind of narrative concept or story around its creation that a lot of their other records have. Um, and what this all belies is the fact that Getting Into Knives is an eminently solid and consistently engaging record that rewards repeat listening. In many respects, I think of it as a writer's album. Um, Get Famous is the only track here that approaches the conventional single style on this record, and it rollicks with a wholesome Springsteenian energy that's clearly filtered through Daniel's idiosyncratic and more darkly comic style. Um, there's obviously more than a little tinge of witty sarcasm here, uh, and that's a quality of, of much of the writing that I've heard uh, from from Daniel that I really uh, enjoy because it's it's never just like um, purely you know taking the piss. It's always uh, deeply embedded in a real kind of sense of tangible emotional ground groundedness. Um, and yeah, and it's a, it's a great song. Uh, Picture of My Dress is another, is a smoother, uh, a more evocative piece of slice of life storytelling uh, in which an individual and unremarkable moments are rendered with a thoughtful and cosmically amusing clarity. I'm thinking of lines like, uh, I'm in the bathroom of a Dallas, Texas Burger King. Steven Tyler is in the overhead speakers. He doesn't want to miss a thing. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's not just Steven Tyler. He says, I think, uh, Sir Mr. Steven Tyler or something like that. Just uh, yeah. making this real, like, mm, let's say maybe less artful than what the Mountain Goats are doing, uh, giving him a lot of reverence, which I yeah. think is interesting. Yeah, and then there's like an ex extended lines in the song which talk about like uh, eating 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 my burger and, and or eating my meal and like taking the rest of it with me and it's just like these little tiny little details that are rendered like super clearly and, and give you an immediate sense of place um, and and yeah it reminds me of like uh, uh, one of my favorite movies which is Five Easy Pieces um, mm -hmm. I don't know why it reminds me of that but it just does I can um, see why it's a great film. Um, yeah, the final verse of this song in particular, when they're on the road again, I think has um, some of Danielle's typically moving and poetic writing that captures the feeling of wistful nostalgia and bittersweet longing for a distant past. It's a, it's a really great song. Um, the subdued hum of Tidal Wave is, is quite gorgeous. Uh, I especially like the way it integrates these beautiful woodwind instruments, uh, courtesy of Matt Douglas. I'm not quite cultured enough to be able to place them, um, but they are gorgeous and they add so much to the song. Uh, I don't even mind that it's over five minutes long because it is such a joy to spend time in this world. Um, the back-to-back -back centerpieces of Bell Swamp Connection and Great Gold Sheep are both standouts that perfectly illustrate the record's melodic and atmospheric strengths at once. Uh, it's not all ephemeral strumming and sage poetry. There's enough going on in these mixes to not disrupt the more relaxed vibe, but to still layer it with intriguing and fun melodic and rhythmic details. For example, the way that the drums kind of surge and the piano flutters at the end of Great Gold Sheep. Uh, it's something that a lesser band wouldn't care to include or, 
or flavor their sound with, but just adds so much character here in, in such subtle ways. Um, that all said, I, I do think the record does have weak points uh, that I need to acknowledge. Uh, I have, as Sush has already alluded to, I have some production issues. Uh, although I will say that the more I've listened to this record, the fewer they are. <laughs> They're not, they don't bug me as much anymore. Um, but there are definitely points on this record where I think John's voice sounds a bit buried, uh, where the mixes they're trying to create are so delightfully um, busy in a good way that there is not necessarily a lot of room for John's voice to surge across them as they do on some of the older records that I'm used to hearing from them. And so it sounds a bit, I kind of wish he, wish he was a bit more present at times. Um, and so that, that the opening track, I think Corsican Master Stride is an example of that. It's a subtle uh, mixing complaint because you can obviously still hear him, but it does kind of, uh, it sets, sets the record off a bit strange to me, even though that's a good song. Uh, and then there's the track that August has already mentioned, As Many Candles As Possible, where the band, I don't know what, what the thought process was uh, in terms of mixing this, but the whole band just sounds really muddy and ill-defined. Uh, it's a real shame. Uh, I do not care for that at all. Um, I do think as well that the second half of this record towards the end, it does kind of hit a bit of a brick wall uh, with, uh, Sersh has definitely encouraged me to give Rat Queen a bit more of a chance because I don't particularly love that song, but she's described it in a really beautiful way. Um, and I, but it's more, I think, the songs after that that I don't really care for as well. Like uh, Wolf Count is a, is a beautiful track in the vein of the summier, sunnier and reverb heavy middle stretch of the record, but it does feel a bit weirdly placed where it is and also a bit redundant at this point in the album. Uh, and then Harbour Me is kind of a bit of a, it's a nice sentiment, but the song itself feels a bit underwritten. It's kind of a bit of a shrug. Uh, and the, the title track as well is another example where I enjoy what, and I, I quite enjoy what John is capturing lyrically and thematically with the song, but I don't find it to be a particularly well composed piece of music musically. Uh, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a letdown of, in terms of the closing track. And again, lyrically quite good. I just wish a little bit more had gone into it musically. Um, but I respect it for where it is, and especially for the way that it also kind of encapsulates John's current headspace and where he's at at the present moment with the band's 19th album, as well as kind of touching into the political sort of side of things, as, as Sir has already touched on. Um, another thing I want to note, uh, generally I don't actually have an, I know Jake has said that he feels the record is a little bit long, um, gen generally I don't actually have an issue with any of the individual song links on this album, uh, I think where the record falters is perhaps that there's just a few too many songs themselves. Um, but all of, the, all of the longest songs on this record, I think, perfectly justify their lengths. Um, and that's because they, uh, they conjure these simple and sunny folk atmospheres that um, really kind of pull you into them and, and, and you kind of linger in them. And they're very beautiful and plaintive. And I think if they had been shorter, it wouldn't have necessarily allowed the tracks to establish that kind of hold that they take on me. Um, it's a very perfect sort of driving along the Oceanside record. It's, it's simultaneously autumnal, but hopeful. And, and, and for the most part, it's just a pleasure to be spending time with John and trusting him to capture a consistent vibe with character and seasoned songwriting. And he does it. Uh, it's not going to win any awards, uh, nor I think will it end up ranking among his best albums. Um, but I don't think it needs to. And in a certain sense, I'm kind of glad that it doesn't. Um, the often kind of dark and moody reaches for profundity on his greatest and most significant works are what make them so important and beloved. But this is the kind of thing where you can just put on as a fan when you don't want to be overwhelmed or depressed or even bathed in catharsis. It's just a record. Mm. I hate this word, but I have to say it. It's just a record you can vibe to. Um, <laughs> I yeah. say that all the time. Oh, no. It's fine. It, I, it's nice when you say it. It's just not a thing that I say because it feels a bit strange. Okay. But for oh, me, because okay. I, I don't really, yeah. But anyway, it is, this is definitely an example of that. Um, sure, sure, sure. Uh, it's definitely not, a, I think this record is definitely not a good intro to the band. And it is not something that I would recommend generally to people who are unfamiliar with them or who are uninvested in John as a songwriter. But I'm very glad it exists all the same. Uh, when you listen to over 100 new releases a year and when you're consuming and trying to properly digest multiple every single week for the sake of reviewing, 
uh, it's an absolute blessing to get something like this or like Springsteen's letter to you, for example, mm. which isn't going to blow anyone's mind, but it does sound exactly like what it should, which is a seasoned and talented songwriter doing what they do best for the love of it and not for anything else. Um, and I have thoroughly enjoyed spending time with it. I think that's a lovely way to describe it really on the money. Yeah. Yeah. The letter you know, to you comparison is really apt, I think. Mm. The wonder of you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad that, I, yeah. I'm really glad that, because if we hadn't reviewed this, because of how uh, much I've kind of not f- listened to John recently, I probably wouldn't have heard it. Um, so yeah. I'm really glad that I did. Yeah, I agree. It's not at the top echelon of what he does. Um, he just has so many records that feel definitive. That'll be hard for any new release. Yeah. Um, but at the top of his like that was pretty good John type records yeah. it's at the top of that for me totally alright um, should we go into our favourite tracks and ratings then uh, yeah, yeah I suppose yeah. alright um, well let's just keep our regular order shall we yeah, um, yeah. Okay. why not yeah, uh, go first. my three favourite tracks are Tidal Wave, The Last Place I Saw You Alive and Picture of My Dress Least favorite is probably as many candles as possible, and I give the record a 6.5 out of 10. Ah, cool. Very nice. Um, yeah, I would have to say a uh, picture of my dress, a uh, tidal way, the track I didn't mention, but I thought Sturcia did a good job of doing justice to. And I'll, I'll, I guess I'll throw in uh, Getting Into Knives. That was a nice song. Least favorite. Um, as many candles as possible, uh, I, as I've made the point of, and I guess it's for me like a five out of ten. But do not let that discourage you from checking this album out. If this sounds like your thing, you should absolutely go for it. Very sweet. Well, my favorite tracks were "I Want You to Get Famous" um, and "I Take a Picture of My Dress." Um, also. Um, New dreams for the rag queen. And I'm going to give this record an eight and a half out of ten. Nice. Um, yeah, and another thing I wanted to say that I forgot in my review that I kind of feel like goes without saying, but um, John's voice is great and I love it when I'm at what he's doing. Again, <laughs> again, I just wish that it was kind of higher in the mix on some of these songs, but he yeah, sounds cool. really good. Uh, my three favorite tracks are A Picture of My Dress, Bell Swamp Connection, and The Great Gold Sheep. Uh, my least favorite track is uh, As Many Candles as Possible. Uh, and I'm going to give this album a 7 out of 10. Fair enough. Right, Great. that's a 6.8. What can I compare that to? The new Fleet Fox has got a 6.7. Um, and, I, and I thought the album was oh, kind of mid, but okay. Um, uh, so did uh, <laughs> Women in Music Part 3. By Heim. That's true. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's our reviews yeah, for today. Wow. Um, yeah. Next week on the podcast, we have actually two new, new major releases. Um, the first mm-hmm. being Ariana Grande's new record, Positions. Positions. We'll be discussing mm-hmm. that. And uh, right. we're also. Or that dance, too. <laughs> Did he? Wait, what? <laughs> did he really? There, there, yeah, he danced. There was a video Sasha Baron Cohen did where he was in the Borat get up and he danced to a song on that. Okay, gosh, I look forward to never watching that. Um, <laughs> uh, and the other, the other album we're going to discuss is the new One O Tricks Point Nero album, Magic yep. OPN, which is uh, I'm also very excited to listen to. One O Tricks Point Seven. Yes, and uh, yes, I think we might also. I don't know. Uh, we haven't really discussed this, but I think we might also uh, have time next week to give a little shout out to the new Emma Ruth Rundle and Thal. Um, collaboration yeah. as well because um, mm. that's I've heard is quite good but anyway um, yes it is. now is the time uh, if you haven't already watched um, the Mountain Goats uh, epi- the Mountain Goats video that Sosha's put up go and watch that but if you Do have it. now is also the time to switch over to our um, Record Club review for this week which is of Burials Tunes 2011 to 2019 um, yeah and, yeah. and let us uh, next week's club next week yep. yeah Oh, and uh, next week's yeah. record club is August pick. Yes, it is my pick. And I have chosen, we are going to go over John Zorn's album Spillane, which is a very strange 
very interesting, very conceptual jazz album from the 80s. I think it is well worth covering, mm -hmm. uh, especially because it's we've, we've gone through some of the, we did a review on very classic jazz. So I think it's also fitting we do uh, a review on jazz that comes after that. After that. Mm. Exactly. Well, if it's a weird album that you're recommending, my only guess is that Morgan will hate it. <laughs> um, okay. On that note. On that note. A note of Morgan hating things. What? Yep. Um, well, rock on London. It's rock over London. I know, yeah. I know. I realized that as soon as I said it, I hate myself. No, um, rock over London. Uh, rock on Chicago. Chicago. Subway. Eat fresh.